All right, here we go. It's our pleasure to bring you Matt Barnes, legendary NBA <laughs> player with a 15-year career, NBA final winner. Uh, just an interesting human being outside of the whole yeah, NBA right. career. <laughs> <laughs> off the court as much as on the court. Right, right. Thank you so much for coming through. Thank you for having me. Well, this is our first time here, so I want to get into your whole story. Yeah. So you grew up uh, in Santa Clara. I was born in Santa Clara. Grew up in San Jose. Okay, in San Jose, which is pretty yeah. close to there. Mm -hmm. White mother, black father. And you have, a, what, a brother and a sister? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm the oldest of three. Okay. Now, your dad was kind of in the streets pretty heavy. Can you talk about that? Yeah, he was, uh, you know, it's interesting because I'm doing a documentary now. And obviously when you're younger, everything is larger than life. And, it, and it's crazier than it, than it really is. But, you know, from my standpoint, uh, talking to him now about those days, you know, he was just saying <clears throat> he was always working. You know what I mean? So he was a, a butcher by trade and then, you know, sold drugs on the side. Um, so I saw a lot at a young age. Um, uh, you know, back in the early 80s, people didn't hide shit. You it's know a crack mean? era. Right. So yeah. I saw, you know, stuff taking place right in front of me, and it, and it really kind of shaped my personality and my mentality. And just having an understanding of, you know, what heavier core, you know, heavy, uh, hardcore shit can do to you. And um, so, like I said, I, I, I learned quick and fast. Okay, so what were, what were some of the most serious things that you actually saw as a kid? Um, I mean, like I said, drug use, um, abuse. You know, I grew up in a, love, a loving but also abusive household. Um, you know, uh, fights. You know, my dad loved to fight, so uh, it was kind of a, a thing for him to either fight in his little flag or f tackle football leagues or at, at the flea market back then. I was back then when they just threw hands. You know, it wasn't about no guns or anything else, so I learned and watched him fight, and I thought that was kind of like the coolest thing that, you know, my dad always won fights, and, and uh, I was taught early on to protect my brother and sister, like, you know, so I grew up fighting as well, and it was just something that we bonded on along with sports. Okay, because you said he was a drug dealer and a drug user. Yes. So was he an addict? I wouldn't say, I, I would say my parents were functioning drug addicts uh, from a standpoint of we never went without you know what I mean? So we were always dressed the right way. Uh, you know, we were always fed. But my parents just partied. You know what I mean? And they had it, I wouldn't say under control, but like I said, they were functioning within what they were doing. Okay. Was it crack or? Coke. Coke. Cocaine, crank. Um, you know, my dad smoked weed too. So those are probably the two or That's not really three things. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, if you're talking about crank, it's yeah. just speed. Mm -hmm. uh, and Coke, those are fairly heavy. Um, so both your parents were using. Mm -hmm. Did you actually see it in front of you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you would walk in and your mom would be doing mm -hmm. a line or something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you're like, what, six, seven years old or something? Man, younger than that. Five years old? You know, younger than that. Like I said, right from the jump, you know, from when I, you know, earliest memories, you know, four or five years old seeing it. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I have people in my family uh, with drug addict parents. Mm -hmm. And it's just really just horror stories. Mm -hmm. Coming home and all the furniture is in the front lawn. Mm -hmm. Lights are off. <laughs> trying to figure out where they're going to, you know, staying in shelters. Yeah, see, my, like I said, ours, that, that's why I kind of say, like, the word addict kind of, I think, puts one perspective on it. Like I said, although my parents were users, it was never anything over the top like that. Like I said, it was always, you know, the lights were always on, and we always had food, and the TV worked, and all that kind of stuff. Like I said, they were just functioning within that. Um, you know, like I said, the one thing that was funny, like, when my dad would get beyond it, he would want to build. So he used to build, like, all of our furniture, like the bookshelf, <laughs> bed frames, coffee tables, all kinds of so shit. He'd be he would get high and start building furniture. He'd be in a garage all night yeah. building shit. You know what I mean? So, like I said, it, the, I don't like to use the word addict because I've seen addicts and seen the effects of it and how unstable their situation was. I would just say, like, like they were functioning users. Okay. And he was dealing as well. Right. So was he getting busted along the way? Um, I wouldn't say busted. He got popped. Um, almost got popped. Uh, um, but he was, you know, he went to jail for, you know, domestic violence a few times uh, against my mom. And I remember seeing that. And then I think the, the, the final point was uh, former acquaintances or friends or, you know, they tried to uh, come rob him uh, at gunpoint. And I remember I was watching out the window probably I was seven or eight-ish. 
and uh, he beat both dudes up, took their guns, and then shortly after that, we packed up and left San Jose and never really returned until, man, when I played for the Warriors um, in 2007. So almost 20 years had passed since I had went back to my old neighborhood. Okay, so you're growing up in this functional but dysfunctional home. Right. At what point did, did basketball become a thing? Um, basketball came on late. My, my thing was football. Um, that's what we always played in my neighborhood. Um, tackle football. We were playing tackle football on the streets, on the cement, on the grass, wherever we could play. So football was the first sport that was introduced to me. Um, what, what position were you playing? Receiver and okay. quarterback. Okay. So, um, you know, just someone that can kind of do it all in football. So that's what I naturally took to. My dad actually had a chance to, uh, he tried out for the 49ers, was one of the last cuts on the 84 team, personally cut by Bill Walsh, you know, so football mm. was in our, in my DNA, and he always used to play in these, you know, these recreational tackle football leagues and, and flag football leagues, so that's what I really got a grasp onto first was football. Okay, so you went to high school, and uh, you played at DeCampo? Del Campo, yeah. Del Campo, sorry. Uh-huh. And you were actually All-American in football and basketball. Yeah, I played everything. You know, back then we we played outside and, and we played all the different sports. So I played football, baseball, basketball, and even ran track for a few years. But football and basketball were definitely my two best sports that I, you know, strived in. Okay. Were you a McDonald's All-American? I wasn't. Uh, so my my senior year of football, I was chasing a, a national record to uh, for touchdowns by a receiver. And I ended up getting turf toe when I kept playing. Now I toe ended up breaking, but I kept playing and I ultimately got the record, but I only played like 10 games of my senior year because of my, of my basketball season because it just took a toll on me after football season. So I had surgery going into UCLA my freshman year on my toe. Okay. So you went to UCLA and you played there for four years. Mm-hmm. Uh, just basketball though, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And you were uh, all Pacific 10. Mm-hmm. Were you considered one of the top players uh, I was in college at the time? I was considered a good, solid player. You know, I wasn't an All-American in college. Uh, we had the number one recruiting class, and I was probably like, the, all the, all four other guys were McDonald's All-Americans. I wasn't. Um, but I just saw early on, and I've always been a grinder, that I was going to have to grind my way through it and, and kind of thug my way through it at times. And I think my heart and my passion alone would put me up another couple levels above my talent level. Well, you graduated from UCLA. Did you want to leave earlier, or did you uh, decide wa- to play all, the, all I, I four I wanted years? to leave early. It, it just didn't work out in that case. Um, so I stayed all four um, and then was drafted in the second round. And really from the jump, never really got a chance to prove myself. So from being drafted to cut within a month and, and playing in the, in, the, in the D League at the time, with which it was called, yeah. uh, in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Right. So you were the 46th overall pick. Mm-hmm. You get drafted by the, the Grizzlies, mm-hmm. traded. but then you were immediately traded to the Cavaliers. Yeah, for Wesley Person. And then once you got to the Cavaliers, then you went to the Fayetteville Patriots, Patriots which yeah. is the D-League. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then, the and then you went year, to the Long Beach Jam? The Long Beach Jam, yeah, okay. which was a, a kind of a start, like an ABA situation where I actually got a chance to play with Dennis Robin for... A handful of games, which was dope, you know, being a big fan of, uh, you know, the the Bulls movement and and what he was doing at the time. I had to be able to play with him for a little bit, but, um, man, we had played in Mexico and horrible gyms and just a horrible situation. I just knew if, you know, this wasn't what what, what my plan and my future was supposed to be, so it it made me, you know, really grind harder, and uh, luckily I got up out of there. Well, people have actually compared you to Dennis Rodman. Think that's a fair comparison? Uh, I mean, obviously, he's a Hall of Famer. I think where it comes from is like our grit and our tenacity and the way we approach the game and, and the way we play as hard as we possibly can every time we're on the floor. Um, you know, my, through my career, even though I lasted a long time, I was a role player. Uh, obviously, he was a Hall of Famer. So I just think that the comparisons are just kind of our approach to the game. Why was he playing uh, for the Long Beach Jam? At I that think point? he was trying to make a comeback. 
Ah, so he had to play there in order to get the, yeah, the NBA so shot I again. I don't know how why the hell he went to to, to <laughs> the Long Beach Jam for that. But uh, you know, yeah, back yeah. then there wasn't really too many stepping stones to get back to the NBA. You know, this is kind of pre big G three. League, what it is, or way pre uh, yeah. Big Three. But kind of the G League now is really a feeder system. But the D League was kind of just getting started. I think it was the second year the D League was going, and, and they were taking maybe one or two players a year. So there wasn't too many paths, and I guess he felt the Long Beach Jam were the the best path to take. Well, John Sally's a regular guest here, mm -hmm. and he played with Dennis Rodman mm -hmm. uh, on the Bulls. And I asked him to tell me the craziest story he's ever, you know, that he could tell me about mm -hmm. Dennis Rodman. And uh, he outdid himself. Uh, did you see this interview? Uh, I, I saw clips. I didn't see that part, though. He said, <laughs> here we go. He said that Dennis Rodman would keep, would, would, you know, in his entourage would be this really attractive blonde you know with like big breasts mm -hmm. and bleach blonde hair really beautiful whatever and dudes would want to try to holler at her he'd be like all right go ahead you know take your shot john sally's like no nah, no nah, i'm cool i'm not interested but he would let dudes holler at her you know take her home whatever and they'd feel like oh yeah i got dennis robin's girl come to find out this was a, a transgender oh. <laughs> imagine i get on the bulls and I'm back with D-Rod, and, uh, and he goes, hey, we're, we're going out to eat. I'm going to be at Morton's, Morton's Steakhouse. I had to mm -hmm. give them a shout out why, I don't know, <laughs> my dumb ass. But anyway, we're at Morton's, and I get there, Jerry Springer's there. So I'm geeked. I want to sit next to Jerry and talk to Jerry at this, at this dinner dinner's having. And there's this blonde at the table, and I look down, and... Uh, a, a blonde, the boobs, the look, the the Marilyn Monroe is at our table, mm -hmm. and I'm like, and I look again, and I look at Dennis, and I smile, and I look at Dennis, and Dennis is like this. He looks at me, nods, he goes, and I go, nah, not my style. That's all I say. And Jerry Springer said, this is pretty crazy dinner. The people, you know, he's talking, talking, and I'm getting to know Jerry because I want to hang with Jerry Springer. And uh, to this day, I'm cool with Jerry Springer. And I see that, and everyone goes, wow. And Dennis says, you're the only person that has not tried to holler at her. And I go, yeah, not my style, not my speed. He goes, Still the same old style. I said, yeah, I'm, I have a radar. It was a dude. It was a guy. That you would purposely Ouch. roll around with. Just to test people's <laughs> to mess with guys. Just to check everybody's temperature, huh? Wow. What was your craziest Dennis Rodman story? I didn't get a chance to get any crazy Dennis stories. Like I said, I no? think we were only there together. Because he came late. He, he didn't come at the start of the season. So I want to say we were only there for like a week and a half, two weeks. Oh, okay. So I didn't really get a chance to really get no no crazy experiences, although I wanted one or, or you know, I wanted to go out and hang out. It's just our timing. We missed each other. Okay. So you do your time with the jam, and then you get a contract with the Clippers. Yeah. How did it feel to finally get on a team? Because this was how many years later after uh, you graduated? Just, no, I just... It, 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 a little bit over a year. Okay. So it wasn't that long. Okay, it wasn't that long. Yeah. Um, it, it was a, a blessing to have the opportunity, you know, but I still felt like it, I hadn't made it. You know, everything, man, my first probably five, six years was an audition, really. You know, I was on, started with 10-day contracts, and I got two of those, and they signed me for the year, and then everything else was a year after that, you know, so it was really just an audition, so I never really got a chance to say, I made it. You know, it was just, a, it, was, it was time to go. Well, right, because you, you got signed to the Clippers, yeah, and then you get signed to the Kings. Yeah, like, so that right was a situation right? where I was supposed to I was supposed to sign a two year deal back with the Clippers, but this is when Sacramento and the Lakers were battling. You know, I mean, this is during you know early two thousands, and Chris Webber was a good friend and almost a mentor of mine. So every summer I'd go back home to Sacramento and work out with these guys, and I would be playing with them, and um, they offered me a contract. You know, what I mean, so I ended up going to Sacramento, my hometown, to play. And then being a part of the Chris Webber, the big Chris Webber trade to Philly, and mm -hmm. after that it was kind of like a, a merry-go-round of, of where I went because I really didn't get a chance to play. Right, because then you get traded to the 76ers. Sixers <laughs> halfway through the the 2004-2005 yeah. season. Yeah. Uh, 
but you never actually suited up. Mm-mm, not that year. The following you, you year. You got injured. Yeah, the yeah. following year I went back and I I can't even tell you how many games I played. I could probably count on one hand um, the games I got. I just never really got a chance. Um, went to the Knicks for a brief time, then right. back to Philly. Um, and, and really just had a, a, a tough go in Philly. Uh, my first coach was Jim O'Brien, like I said, who didn't really give me a chance. The next year I came back and it was Mo Cheeks. And Mo Cheeks was first-time head coach. Uh, to me, too immature. He was still caught in between being a player and, and wearing the suit and being a coach. Um, so we just didn't didn't get along. And, um, you know, luckily I got out of that and then landed in Golden State randomly. Right. And that was the first time you really found a home. Right. How did it feel? This is like 2006 when yeah. we finally made it to Golden State after hopping around for how many years? Three. Three, three years. Three years. Uh-huh. Well, I guess before you joined Golden State, you were going to go back to the NFL. Yeah, I was going to play. I, I is It came to a point where I was just like, man, I keep bouncing around. I'm not really getting a chance to play. I know I could play football. So we had lined up some uh, NFL teams. I don't remember all of them off the top, but I remember speaking with my agent. There was about five to six teams that were willing to give me an open tryout. And hmm. uh, my brother was playing college football at the time. And we were just back and forth. So I would do basketball and football workouts in the summertime, thinking, all right, well, this is going to be my last chance that I'm going to give myself. This is my last summer just going basketball. If it doesn't work right here, I'm going to go football. And luckily, that's the, the time I signed with Golden State. How did that feel to finally sign with the, with the Warriors? That was good because it was random, too. You know what I mean? It was a former teammate of mine, Baron Davis, um, had hit me up. He was in the Bay already. I was in Sacramento just working out during the summertime. And he's like, hey, you know, we're having pickup games at the facility today if you want to come down and play. And so I drove down an hour and a half and played and played well, not knowing that Don Nelson was – upstairs in his office and he, and he saw us play and he came down to me after the uh, after we had played pickup and asked me you know told me I played well and where was I signed at this year and I just like you know nobody <laughs> and he's just like you know we have 16 guarantees already and I want to say they only keep 14 so they had 16 people guaranteed under contract plus two or three guys are bringing the training camp he's like I can't promise you anything but if you play as hard as you play today you know you'll have a shot to make the team and, uh, you know, that's all I needed. That was the first time I really felt that, like, a coach had confidence in me and saw what I can do and, and gave me a shot. And, you know, and I, I ran with it. Well, I guess before you came to Golden State, you had only made 10 three-pointers in your mm-hmm. whole career. Mm-hmm. And then in the 2006-2007 season, you made 106 100. Yeah, three-pointers. the largest jump in NBA history. <laughs> I know. Something from... crazy like that. From ten total, t- ten total in like what four years right. to one hundred and six right. in it one was, season. It was just really an opportunity. I think there's several people in my position, um, you know, that can play, but just you know, we were lost in the shuffle. You know, mm. being late round picks or not being drafted. Uh, you know, there's a lot of politics in the NBA, and if you're a first round pick, they're going to give you every opportunity to play. And you know, if you're making more money than someone, they're going to give that person an opportunity to play. So I was never making a ton of money, and I was a second round pick. You know what I mean? So I really had to fight my way to 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 even get on the court. And I think that's when a lot of guys get lost in the shuffle because they never even get a chance to get on the court. I mean, were you basically Steph Curry over there before Steph Curry? No, I mean, <laughs> I, I I had held the record for threes in a game, I think, before Steph came along. Uh, I think it was seven uh, until, you know, the Splash Brothers came along and, and it was over. demolished it. <laughs> um, you know, but it was really, like you said, the first time I, I felt like I had a team and, and it wasn't far from home and the, the city really took to me. The Bay really, you know, fucked with me and it, it, it was a special time and we had a really special team that year. Was the money starting to come at this point? Um, so that was my last, my second year in Golden State. Um, crazy story. I, I got offered, you know, because I had bounced around. And looking back on it now, I look at it different than obviously when in the situation. But I had had a really good season and helped our team make NBA history. And I uh, got offered a three-year, $12 million deal from the Warriors. Mm. And I declined it because I was hearing that I was, you know, you should be getting 28, you know, 30 million. So I, I, you know, I changed agents. I just listened to some people that, you know, didn't know what they were talking about. I ended up changing agents, didn't get the big money deal. And I kind of felt like, okay, well, just give me one more year to prove myself. I'll take this 4 million, one year for 4 million, and let me prove myself again and then pay me. And I guess that rubbed Don Nelson the wrong way. In the beginning of that next season is when my mom died from cancer. She would die as no November first, two thousand seven, and died November twenty seventh. So at the very beginning of the season, she dies within the first month. And 
needless to say, it was just a, a season that was lost in the mix. And like I said, I had rubbed Don Nelson the wrong way looking back on it because he was someone that really gave me my first chance. And then I don't take his three year, $12 million offer. So he's kind of like almost, you know, I remember when I was kind of coming out of the clouds, ready to start playing again, he's almost kind of like, you know, fuck you, you had a chance to, to take this deal. I'm glad you didn't, your time here is up. And he didn't play me. Mm. So someone that really gave my first chance was my biggest supporter my first year. Um, I guess he really felt like I disrespected him by not taking that long-term deal and, and pretty much told me, get the fuck out. <laughs> hey, you know, I just lost my dad on Monday. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, and you talk about losing your mom. Uh, it's tough. Oh, it's very tough. Especially, you know, my dad had Parkinson's and you okay. watch that slow, the, yeah. See, that and slow that's what, decline. And then yeah. with cancer, it's the same type of thing. Well, that's what people ask me, you know, with my mom's situation was it was so fast and so drastic. Do you wish you had more time with my mom? And it's kind of a catch-22 because obviously you want more time, but you never want to see them get to a point where you possibly saw your dad get to, you know? So it was just like my mom got sick and she was gone so fast, but... You know, I got to spend a lot of time with her, and that was the one thing that I definitely give the Warriors credit for. You know, I was driving back and forth pretty much every day, and they were allowing me to miss practice, just come to games so I can spend a lot of time with my mom and kind of got, you know, I was at peace. Uh, you know, unfortunately, when I lost her, but it was it was tough um, for everything just to happen so fast. Yeah, I had to tell the, the hospital to, like, a do not incubate, do not resuscitate, mm -hmm. because he had gotten mm -hmm. to such a bad state that if they had done that, uh, he wouldn't have recovered from it because right. he'd already been incubated before. So it was like signing your father's death life, warrant right? in a crazy. way. And you, it's like you're, the person's life is in your hands and it's your parent and it's just like a fucked up mm -hmm. situation, man. Especially, yeah. you know, someone who's been in your life the whole time. Right, you know, and my, my childhood was rocky, you know, so my mom was, even though my dad was there, my mom almost played mom and dad. Yeah. You know, so she was my right hand, so to lose her... Um, you know, at the beginning of the season was tough. Yeah. Well, you do your time for the Warriors, then you join the Phoenix Suns. Mm-hmm. For uh, just a year. One, one, just one year? One year, yeah. yeah. Um, this, is, this is an interesting season. So I was coming off a 2006-07 season where I played really well. 2008, or 2007-2008 is when my mom died, so I don't really play that much and, and kind of have an off season. So I'm going into Phoenix with a fresh start. Um it's where my twins were born, you know, so kind of really changed my outlook on life, uh, having two little boys. Um, also a time when I was playing with Shaq, and um, this whole basketball-wise bullshit came about. Aha, uh -huh. so that happened, and, Shaq yeah. was playing for Phoenix, at, Phoenix the time? at that time? Oh, I forgot about that, yeah. So it was a situation where my ex was, you know, coming to me, you know, with a kind of a pitch, oh, this is going to be a show about us stepping outside of your shadow and raising a family and running foundations. And I'm just like, nah, because up to that point, like our, our relationship was kind of rushed in really fast. You know, we had kids and lived together and, you know, we're in a different city within like a year and a half mm -hmm. uh, of being together. So I was just like, I think the last thing we need to be, whether it's a good portray uh, portrayal or not, is just on TV. Let's kind of find our situation. But Right, because people don't realize, people think that Basketball Wives is just Shawnee O'Neal. Yeah. But apparently Shaq is part of that whole project as well. Well, Shaq, I, I want to say Shaq was... I've, I don't know, he was a driving force. He's the one that convinced me, you know, because my ex came to me several times and I told her no several times. And then Shaq kind of pitched me on it and what it was going to be and all this kind of shit. Come on, and Matt. I, you know right, you want to do it. Right. Come on. And, and I, and I <laughs> It'll finally, be fun. <laughs> I agreed, you know what I mean? And then the following year after Phoenix, we went to Orlando. So that's when basketball, my wise Miami started, was uh, when we went out there. What was it like to play with Shaq? Cool. I, I mean, I, being a Laker fan, uh, seeing him in, when I was in college and, and, you know, him coming up to you and seeing him, he was just one of the most dominating forces we've ever seen. And, you oh, know, yeah. obviously I got him on the backhand, uh, you know, the, the, the last nine, so to speak, of his career. Uh, but still just a great guy, great energy, you know, like a seven foot kid, but still nasty and, and, and one of the greatest to ever do it. Yeah, me and him did a mixtape back in the day. Really? When he dissed Kobe. Oh, really? You were a part of that? I was, I was, oh, I was that's project. funny. That was my project with him. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah, where basically he blamed Kobe for getting him traded. <laughs> he, he put that in his rap. 
<laughs> no, Shaq is crazy, and you know you see him and Damon. I haven't yeah, even heard part two of yeah, him and Damon. They're rap beefing right now. They're, they're dropping song after right. song. Like so, it's crazy. No, well, I mean, Shaq, Shaq's a platinum artist, though. Let's not yeah. forget that he's got two platinum albums and a gold. He album. sold over what a hundred million records or something, some, right? Some, something, some, something I don't crazy. know about a hundred million. Oh, okay. Let's let's slow down. Hold okay, so that's, million, that's, what, no. that's what someone was telling me when they were trying to make Shaq's case. Because to me, I thought the first round, I thought Damon got Shaq in the first round. Well, Shaq sold a hundred million records, and he has this many times platinum. I'm like, I feel you, but I just feel Damon. Barred him in the first one, but I haven't heard the second one. Yet. Maybe a couple million. Okay, together. okay. Together, maybe two or three all together. So that was extra gas then. Yeah, and I remember when I first met Shaq, because you know we kind of were all you know introduced on the phone, mm -hmm. you know, and started did, did our project remotely. And then when I met him, you know, and I'm like six two. Oh, he's a giant. And it's like the biggest human being I'd ever seen in my entire. Life. And then you were when you were dealing with me, he was just big and muscular. Yeah, this tone. was like 2004, yeah. let's say. And it was like, because you know, you meet these tall guys, like you know, like me and John mm -hmm. Sally are, are friends. Mm -hmm. And John Sally's tall oh. was 6'10, I think, right. but he's skinny. He's not. Yeah, you got right. this guy that's seven, what, seven one or something, and like what, 400 pounds, like just absolutely an insane looking human being. For him to move and be able to do what he did at that size is just why to me he's the most physically dominating player I think we've ever seen. I, I would say outside of Will Chamberlain because Will Chamberlain wasn't playing against big old guys. Right. Shaq was still playing against other big guys and able to do what he does. So Yeah, I always bug out at the Yao Ming picture with him and Yao Ming next and to Yao's, each other. Yeah. And, and, and I was like, Shaq looks like a regular guy <laughs> next to Yao. Well, that's the thing. Like, when, you know, playing, a, I'm 6'8", I'm so I want to say the average height is around 6'7", six, yeah. six, you know, 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, so when people see me, see me on TV, I look average. You know yeah. what I mean? Like blend in. And then when they see me, I feel like, holy shit, I didn't know how big you were. I'm just like, right. I'm 6'8". You know, I just look average amongst <laughs> all these other big ass all guys. All these other giants. <laughs> right. Okay, so you play for the Phoenix Suns for a year. Mm -hmm. And then you go to Orlando. Mm -hmm. Why only one year for the Suns? Um, that was a year, that was an interesting year. I mean, I played a lot, I played well, but that was the year that Amari Stoudemire, that was kind of the end of their run, you know, because they'd kind of developed a new style of basketball that kind of took the small ball, you know what I mean? Like, we did it in Golden State. They mastered it with Nash, Amari, and, and Sean Marion. Sean Marion was gone. Amari Stoudemire almost gets his eye poked out, and we missed the playoffs for the first time. They hired Terry Porter at the beginning of the season. They fire him at All-Star break. That's like the fastest firing in NBA history. <laughs> Um, we get Alvin Gentry, and I guess we barely missed the playoffs. And um, the next one, you know, just one of the guys to move. I guess they're trying to, you know, move in a different direction. Um, so then I'm off to Orlando. Okay. Is that when the Kobe flinch happened? Yeah, that was it. <laughs> Tell me about that whole situation. Um, it was just, it, it, was, it was towards later in the year. Um, you know, Kobe and I have always obviously had a mutual respect for each other and it, and it goes back to when he first came to LA. I was at UCLA and he was younger, you know, so he used to come up to UCLA and work out and and play and whatnot and it was just like, I would see like this guy's two years older than me, like this is guy's the future, like you see how dope and talented he is. So it was just me kind of having a fascination with, uh, okay, if I'm going to make the NBA, this is the kind of guy I'm going to have to guard. So I kind of just early on locked into that and, uh, you know, so we just kind of had battles, um, you know, kind of throughout my career. And I kind of think that's when it kind of came to a head. Um, it was like late March going into the playoffs. These teams had played in the finals the year before when the Lakers had beat Orlando. So I came in the next year and we we're expected to meet up in the finals again. And uh, it was just a back and forth game. And uh, one thing about Kobe is he's obviously physically gifted, but his mental approach to it is second to none. So he'll do all kinds of stuff to mentally fuck with you without saying a word, you know, like gra grabbing you, elbowing you, mm. cheap shotting you, um, just doing just sneaky veteran shit um, that Kobe can get away with. And it just got to the point where they kept calling me for stuff. And it was really, you know, I was kind of, you know, doing something. I was retaliating most of the time and I would get called. So it just came to a point where I'm like, fuck basketball. We're about to fight. You know what I mean? That's where <laughs> like kind of my mental uh, state it got. So when uh, late in the game, when you you know when you see that play, if you look at me, I'm watching the whole play behind his head transpire. So I really don't even see his face, and I just ball fake. Like I don't know where it wasn't like, hey, I'm a ball fake this dude. Like the shit just kind of happened by itself. It almost felt like it just I ball faked him. I didn't realize how came, how close I came to his face or where his face was. But you know I was looking at the play behind him. I was looking for Vince Carter on the back door, and it just it made NBA history. 
Well, he didn't move at all. He didn't flinch. He didn't at blink. All. He, he didn't, didn't breathe. <laughs> he's a he's a killer, man. He's a machine. He's a killer, you know. But right after that, uh, you know, my situation fell through in Orlando um, with Stan Van Gundy and, and and things being said and done where it didn't work out. Um, I was actually supposed to go to Toronto for a multi-year deal, um, but then Kobe hit me hit me up one day on the phone and uh, asked me what I was doing. I just kind of told him I was up in the air. I was also talking to Pat Riley at the time because that's when LeBron was heading to Miami. Mm. So he was breaking down to me that, you know, the crunch time lineup was going to be me, LeBron, D. Wade, Mike Miller. Damn, who was the fifth? It was somebody else. That, you know, this is the crunch time. This is, you know, we can win a championship with this. And I fully believed in him, but my whole thing is I've been a Laker fan my whole life. You know, and the fact that Kobe called me up like, Anyone crazy enough to fuck with me is crazy enough to play with me. I'm just like, shit, I got to go back to Cali and play with Cove. So that's what I did. Yeah, I remember when I interviewed John Sally recently. And him and him and Kobe know each other, mm -hmm. obviously. And uh, he said that Kobe went to the NBA straight out of high school, back when you could actually do that, mm -hmm. because he wanted to play against Jordan. He knew at that point that he was going to be one of the greats. I and if he didn't play Jordan one on one, well, not one on one, but in a game, even though this was Jordan's like last <laughs> year or whatever in the league, that people are going to say, "Oh, well, you know, he's not better than Jordan." Mm -hmm. So he, as an eighteen or a seventeen year old, he already knew mm -hmm. this was about to happen in yeah. the future. I remember when I asked him, I said, "Why did you, why you didn't go to Duke? Why didn't you go to college? Like, you just knew you were good enough for the pros." He said, no, I heard Michael was retiring. I wanted to play with him and against him. Oh, before he that's why Kobe went straight out of high school? Smartest thing in the world. So he could play Jordan. He was a sicko. Kobe, I've never played, and I, you know, I've got a chance to play with Alvin Iverson and Chris Paul, and some of these guys are that are insane competitors, but never know one like Kobe. You know, the shit I saw him play through and, you know, in his personal life and, and physically uh, playing through and, you know, just his will to always be the greatest and, and, and expect, the, you know, the most out of us. Uh, it was a special time to, you know, always battle against him and then finally play with him. I mean, when you heard Kobe say that he would have won, whatever, 12 championships if uh, Shaq wasn't so lazy, <laughs> and you played with both, right? what's your take on that statement? I think if they could have stayed together, there's no telling how many they would have won. There's no telling. Uh, yeah. I think definitely another two or three, possibly. Um, because they were the two, you know, they were fire and ice. You know, Shaq was the dominant middle presence at the time, which, you know, the game was still in need of. And then Kobe was unstoppable on the wing. And then, you know, they had a great coach, and then they had a bunch of great role players that fit that system perfectly. Um, so there's no telling, you know, how many championships they could have won. But, when, you know, when it gets back and forth to the, the, to the finger pointing and who's fault and who got who traded, like, you know, I only like to speak on shit I was around, you know what I mean? So from the outside looking, obviously I was still there, but I don't really know what was what. Um, you know, so I'd always heard Kobe's this, Kobe's that. But then, you know, when we finally got a chance to become teammates and talk to him and see him on a day-to-day -day basis, Kobe's cool as shit. So now you're at the Lakers and you were there for two years. Mm -hmm. So I tear my knee the first year. The first year they're going for a three-peat. And I tear my meniscus... February, something like that. I'm out six to eight weeks. Um, you know, I was a, a key rotational player for that team. Get back right before the playoffs, and although I played, I just wasn't healthy. Uh, we get swept by the Mavericks, and then that's when I want to say they beat Miami in the finals, if I'm not mistaken, that year. Um, next year, so that then at the end of that year is when um, – Phil Jackson sits us in the room towards the end of the season and telling us this is his last year because he uh, has cancer. And, um, you know, for me being three years removed from losing my mom at that time, it was something that, you know, that, that, that hit a chord, obviously. And I think kind of it was crazy. You know, it was kind of changing of the guards. Um, so to go from Phil Jackson and his historical run as a coach to Mike Brown, um, it was tough. It was night and day. And, you know, from the jump, Mike didn't really have players' respect. And it was just, it was a mess that season. Well, you started your relationship with Gloria back during, like, the, the Phoenix Suns? No, the, the Warriors the first the time. The Warriors, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. But then, when you were playing with the Lakers, 
seemed like the relationship started to get rocky. Yeah, so that was a year or two in the basketball wise. Um, you know, not to place any blame on anybody, but I was kind of being a young athlete, and she was just kind of becoming known in the in, in the entertainment space. You know, so she was kind of feeling herself. So that kind of came to a head uh, in 2010, my first year with the Lakers, and we split for like 10 months. I want to say. Okay. Well, were you married that by time. that time? No. Uh. Uh-uh. Okay. So we split for about 10 months. Um, got back together. Uh, you know, to me, it was having a fucked up childhood. I just didn't want my kids to get off to the same start um, that I did. You know, so I tried everything in my power to make that work. And I just think we found each other at the wrong time. You know what I mean? I was just kind of becoming, developing my own name in the NBA. So I was doing what I did. She was younger, had two kids. We jump on this reality show, and then now she's kind of coming into her own as well. And I just think the time that we were in love, we're at different times. Well, you said that doing Basketball Wives was the biggest mistake you've ever made. Uh, I just think, and I don't even blame the show for us breaking up by any means. I just, I think once you open up that book to allow people to look at your private life, you can't get mad when people comment on it. You know what I mean? And that was that was my hardest thing was. These people are t- like, you know, at the time talking about my, the mother of my children and some people even crazy enough to talk about my kids. So it took me a while to <clears throat> understand that we allowed this. We gave them access to our yeah. life so I can't cuss everyone out in the world that has something to say that I don't like about my family. Yeah, I've always turned down reality shows. I've always kept my private life completely private. Right. I even stay off camera just yeah. for all the things that you're talking about right. to try to avoid all that. Yeah. Like, I'm cool with the money, but I don't right. need all the extra. Yeah, no, the, the, <laughs> the, the, that kind of fame is overrated. You know what I mean? But, you know, like I said, I don't blame the situation. It, it probably didn't help. But it also opened my eyes to behind the camera and, and the TV side of, and, and realizing, you know, that's what I'm doing in the space now is, you know, realizing that it's not too, it's not tough to create shows, but quality shows. You know yeah. what I mean? I think there was a whole deception of how this show was supposed to be and the franchise, I guess, has made money and been successful. But it's just a horrible depiction of, I think, what they're trying to perpetuate to begin with. Yeah, I mean, because it was kind of an offshoot of Love and Hip Hop. Before, right? yeah. Before, love and yeah. Hip Hop was first, right. and then this was kind of the sports No, I, was, was Love and Hip Hop first? No, I think, I think so. Love and Hip Hop came after. Oh, no. I think basketball, I, I think it was like Flavor Flav, and then like basketball-wise was like right up there. What was it? Love and Hip Hop season one was 2011. Yeah, so basketball-wise was 2009. Not, oh, okay, you're right. I think Love and Hip Hop came after. Oh, so okay. this is kind of... It's, it's oh, so kinda, Love and Hip Hop was the hip hop version of basketball-wise. It started, yeah, okay. it started this whole uh, reality TV fiasco. You know, hmm. and, and to think that w- crazy part is, I remember <clears throat> when I knew because I, like I said, Shaq kind of reeled me in, and I agreed to do a show or two. And I remember one of the first shows was we were in Orlando at the time. This one, all the Tiger Woods shit was happening. Like hmm. Tiger was at our games, courtside, cool, talking to everyone. Then all of a sudden, the bombshell hits where he's got twenty bitches all over the world, and all this <laughs> kind of stuff is going on. So and the we're, most horrible looking women. Right. Also. So it was such a disappointment. So, like, yo, this right. is all you could get, Tiger. Like, <laughs> so uh, you know, we're in the midst of that. So I remember we had the whole cast over to our house in Orlando. And the way they kind of plant shit in each person, like they were trying to t- tell one girl to ask me something and something. So basically it just came down to like everyone looking at me like, well, what do you guys do on the road? Or uh, what do your teammates do on the road? And, you know, I- I've seen you talk to Tiger and all this kind of shit. And I was like, hold on. I like, I called timeout right away. I was like, yeah, I'm not doing this shit. Like yeah. I'm the only current player um, in a relationship because Shaq and Shawnee, I don't know if they were still together or not at that time. You know, one of the only people, Shaq and I, in the league that's kind of representing basketball-wise, I'm just like, you think I'm a fucking snitch on any, you know what I mean? I'm just not. So it was something I saw early on, just how scripted everything was and how yeah. drama-filled they wanted everything to be. And they never wanted to see, like, me, Gloria, and the twins happy. They wanted to see, like, me and Gloria fighting and Gloria fighting with the other girls. And it was just early on, I was just like, yeah, I'm not with this shit. So... I tried to pull her, but she was under contract, and they threatened to sue her and do all this kind of shit, so she had to stick in there. But it was a mess from the beginning. Well, around the time when you were with the Lakers, you got arrested for domestic violence. <clears throat> right before. Oh, right before. So this was the summer going to the Lakers, and uh, you know all it was was a arguing, like a screaming match that our neighbors called the cops for. 
and the cops came up. I opened the gate. They came in right away, handcuffed me. I'm just like, yo, what the fuck? Like, well, you know, domestic violence in California, someone has to get arrested. Well, that's because of the OJ case. Okay, thanks, OJ. That, that's because of the OJ case. I remember I spoke to a cop about this. Yeah. Because before then, you could go in, calm everyone talk, down, and Talk leave, about it like it was right? not like these. And, and that's what happened with OJ uh -huh. over and over again. Oh, okay. You know, Nicole, Nicole Simpson kept calling the police. Really? They would come over. They would see it's OJ. They would say, okay, everyone's cool. And they would leave. And they uh -huh. kept doing it and leaving. And then she ended up dead. They juiced me, and huh? then and then that's why they that was, changed yeah. the laws. Yeah, because I had that. no idea. Like yeah. I said, they came. I oh, I let them in the gate. They came down our driveway. We're both talking. She's standing up. I'm sitting down outside, and they come right over to me and handcuff me. I'm like, yo, what the fuck? And they're like, you know, well, in this situation, you know, someone has to go to jail. I'm just like, well, all we're all we're doing is art, you know. But that's just this and that, and so I got taken away. So. It was called domestic violence. Luckily, it blew over because it wasn't. It was an argument. But like I said, I got, I didn't even know what you, you just told me. I didn't even know there was an actual thing. Yeah. Well, a regular couple gets into an argument, someone gets arrested, mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. You know, their job probably does, doesn't find right. out. They take a sick day mm -hmm. and then it gets brushed under, under the under the rug. Mm -hmm. But you're an NBA player. Right. Yeah. And on basketball wise. And headed to the Lakers. Headed to the Lakers. You know what I mean? So it, it's, it's the whole different thing. Was that the first like sort of first like scandal that you dealt with as an nba player um yeah first of of, of many to come first of many. you know what i mean but yeah definitely the probably the first and like i said it really didn't you know once we got to kind of speak our piece and got it out there and luckily it was kind of pre so like really the heavy social media era had hit you yeah. know what i mean so we, we got to get kind of get out in front of it and, and defuse it and um you know it, it, it didn't spread and, and cause the controversy that it possibly could have well then you went to go play for the clippers mm -hmm. you were there for three years mm -hmm. uh you were named defensive player of the year mm -hmm. for so, the team for the team so your career is starting to really build up. Mm -hmm. And right along with that came the craziness. Mm -hmm. All the fines mm -hmm. start happening. Well, you said that you paid over half a million dollars in fines throughout Pretty your close, career? yeah. Half right a million there. dollars. Right up there, yeah. So the fines just started coming. Uh, in October uh, of 2012, uh, you were getting arrested. Mm -hmm. And uh, you called the cops an F word, mm -hmm. which was caught on camera. Yeah. So that was a crazy situation. So this is, that backs up. This was actually, it almost ended up being a harassment case that I was going to file on the Manhattan Beach police because they racially discriminated on, on several athletes in that area, but then kind of talking and getting a bigger picture, you know, someone kind of sat me down just like, you know, even though you're, they're in the wrong, suing the police department is just probably not the best thing to do. So I kind of backed off it. But what it was, was I was pulled over four, three times by the same cop within a month. Wow. So I was coming home from practice every time. The first time I was leaving, it was right right before the playoffs. Uh, first time I was leaving practice, I had an all-black Escalade, and I was driving home from practice with no shirt on and with the windows down, so I'm covered in tattoos, music. Cop comes up behind me for a second, gets on the side of me, stares at me, gets past me, slows down, gets back over behind me again and pulled me over. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And, you know, I pulled you over for no front license plate. All right. Gave me a ticket. Pulled me out of my car, made me sit down. Kind of a dickhead movie. I don't think you need to do all that. I don't even remember how many days later. I want to say maybe five to seven days later, pulled over again. You have 10 on your windshield. You have 10 on your windows. <laughs> All right, motherfucker. Same thing. Pulls me out of my car. For tent? For tent. Gives me a <laughs> ticket. Same cop. Third time, pulls me over, tells me that my license is suspended, which I found out it wasn't, takes my car, and makes my, my cell phone have just died. So we were playing Oklahoma City in the playoffs at this time. So we had just got back from Oklahoma City late that night, came in for film session. I got treatment because I had a sprained ankle, didn't even practice. Driving home because we have a game the next day. This motherfucker takes my car, and I don't have no one to call, so I had to take my suitcase out of the car because we had just got back, not knowing how long my car's going to be gone, and walk home probably a mile and a half with... Um,
bags of ice on my ankle and my knees from this fucking cop. Mm. It was before, oh, you had a dead cell phone, so you couldn't even call Yeah, so I couldn't call no one. Oh, yeah, you, you know what I mean? So fast forward, the end of that season, this same cop is in Manhattan Beach, and Gloria and I went to dinner on the Strand, and I'm walking back to my car, and I guess he had saw my car and just parked next to my car. So we're walking back, and we're kind of in the space where there's like an alley, and then the parking lot, and then the beach. Like, that's how close we are to the beach. I'm taking pictures coming all the way down. You know, I'm playing for the Lakers, so I'm everywhere I go, it's kind of a little, little mob. So I'm taking pictures, signing autographs, being cool with everyone. Walk to my car, and I hear someone say, Matt Barnes, come here. It was kind of like a stern voice. It didn't sound like a fan. I looked over, and I told Gloria, I was like, there's that punk-ass cop. And he's like, come here. And he told me I was under arrest. What the fuck was I under arrest the last time for? Something, something was wrong. And I'm just like, no, nah, you're not arresting me. Like, I was the closest I've ever been to just wanting to slap the shit out of a cop. So he tells me to come over here, and he told me to sit in the alley. Like, come over here and sit down. I'm like, who the fuck you think you're talking to, first of all? I'm like, no, hell no. <clears throat> Are you resisting? Are you resisting? I'm just like, I'm not resisting. I'm just not going to fucking sit down in no piss-filled alley, you know, where these bums are pissing. It's like right by the bars. I mean, I'm not going to sit down. Oh, so you're resisting. That's what you're telling me you're resisting. So he does, like, this little walkie-talkie to his shirt. And when I tell you, within a minute and a half, five other cops, like, swarm us, like, coming from everywhere like this shit was already planned out so five other cops come Gloria starts cussing this officer out he he knows not to become because I told him if he come next to me I was gonna slap the shit out of him so he has his partners come and like try to remove me because I was holding on to a pole like this and Gloria was standing in front of me like he wasn't gonna come gonna come arrest me so uh in long story short I end up getting arrested they find out this is a new dude trying to make his name fucking with me. Um, so I actually acquired a lawyer and we we're about to sue them. But like I said, got talked to by one of kind of like the OGs, just like it's not a good look. So I kind of just let it let it go. Well, you got suspended for one game. Mm -hmm. How much money do you lose in a suspension like that? I don't remember. I think it's based on what I'm making at the time. So... I don't know, 50, 80, something, 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 you know. Something, high, high five digits. Something you don't want to lose. Right. You know, something you shouldn't have to and lose. And it's not a good look for you. No, not at all. Because like I said, this is before kind of social media. So it's just whatever's put out there is put out right. there. I mean, TMZ like, still put right, out the video. So, you, so. It, it's before I really had my own platform with like, like, yo, the, like just giving you the story. Like this motherfucker yeah. pulled me over within a month and a half, four different times. You know what I mean? So it's, it's pre that. And, and like I said, it looks bad and, and, and. You know, I'm playing for the Lakers, and, and it kind of kind of feeds right into whoever everyone else thinks I am already. You know, I kind of developed a reputation by that time, so it kind of fed right into the narrative that everyone, he's a thug, he's out of control, he's this, this, and that, he's getting arrested. So I just kind of had to take that shit on the chin. Right, because you said after the uh, the Kobe Flinch incident, you kind of became the villain of the yeah. NBA. Yeah. Did that bother you at all? Uh, I had to learn how to deal with that because I wasn't a bad guy. I, I think people, like I said, all this pre-social media – you know, people get a taste of you for two and a half hours. And I'm just a competitive, emotional person, you know, a protector. Somewhere I wear my heart on my sleeve. So these people get a glimpse of me, but they think they know who I am. You know what I mean? So I think having to learn how to deal with people just hating me for no reason was something new in sports. Well, then, what I feel is the cherry on top <laughs> on May 8th. <laughs> 2015, you got fined fifty thousand dollars for telling James Harden's mother, "Suck my dick, bitch." Yeah, that was a crazy story too. I had to I apologize to her. So that was a that situation was. So we're in the playoffs um, with the Clippers, and um, James and I were obviously going at it, and I was guarding him, and I had fouled him, and he went to the foul line. So. I'm, out, I'm down sitting on the free throw line with my hands on my knees, kind of hunched over, and I hear someone through, think about it. So this is during a playoff game, so it's loud. I keep I hear someone say, take your faggot ass back to L.A. like three different times. And the first couple of times I let it slide, and then I look up and I catch the person saying it the third time. So I didn't, I don't even know if there's film on it. I didn't verbally say it. I mouthed it. I'm just like, suck my dick. You know what I mean? Not knowing who she was, not knowing the situation, just knowing that like, this lady's you know, telling me to take my faggot ass back to LA. I'm like, yo, this chick is tripping. 
<laughs> so the game, <laughs> the game is is going on, and you know I kind of forget about it when we get on the bus, and I still don't know who the uh, no, excuse me. So at, at halftime, um, I'm trying to think. I'm like, who is this lady? You know, she must be a player's mom. So I'm thinking like, okay, well, maybe I should apologize because I let my emotions get the best of me, although she said what she said. I still didn't know who the lady was. So then in the locker room, DeAndre Jordan tells me, he's like, did you cuss out a, a parent tonight? And I'm like, I don't know. I, I hope not. And they're like, you said so-and-so to, mo- to, to James's mom. I was like, to whose mom? He's like, James Harden. I was like, fuck. <laughs> That's who that was, because I guess his mom is friends with her, and the world travels fast. So after the game, I'm waiting out by the buses, and uh, I see her come out, and with James and his brothers, and I try to make my way, excuse me, ma'am, I apologize. I let, you know, my emotions get the best of me. I lost my mom. I don't disrespect women like this, you know, accept my apology, and she kind of, like, played me to the left, like, eh, and, like, whatever. So I just, all right, so like I said, we're in this series And um, we moved to L.A., and I want to say it was Mother's Day. So on Mother's Day, um, I approached her again and apologized, and, you know, that's when she kind of possibly accepted it, Um, you know, but we shook hands, and I just kind of really told her, you know, I really apologized for my actions and letting it get the best of me. I, You know, I lost my mom again. I kind of gave her the whole spiel and really apologized and meant it. But, yeah, that was another big fine that— 50000 That was your biggest fine? Um, probably At that point. my biggest singular fun, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I heard that James Harden was actually okay with your apology. Yeah, we had squashed it, and it, come to find out, you know, his mom sits down there and, and talks crazy to a lot of people. You know what I mean? She just happened to talk crazy, to, I guess, to the to the person that, that, that took offense to it. And like I said, if I, if I would have known it was mom, I obviously wouldn't have said nothing. Uh, I was just caught up in the game, and, you know, her screaming what she screamed, I said what I said. Okay, so you're just hit, getting hit with fine after <laughs> yeah. fine after mm-hmm. fine. Mm-hmm. And are you having big contracts during this time? Um, I'm having contracts. They're not huge, but I have very solid contracts at the time. It was just, it was a time, man, where I was, that was a time I was just going through a lot of shit with my ex. You know what I mean? So I was trying my hardest to be able to focus on the court and, and, and play, but little things would trigger me, and I had a very quick trigger. You know, at the same time, that's the end of that se- that, that season was, you know, I got into it with Doc Rivers. Um going into the playoffs, I think. Mm-hmm. We were watching film one time, and he didn't want to call out the players he needed to call out, so he called out me on two, like, bullshit things and was being hella disrespectful. And I just took offense to it, and, you know, I think the whole room had felt it at the time that it was just his day to pick on me, but it was just, it was my time where I was going through, you know, a, a nasty split up, and I just wasn't taking no shit from anyone. So I, fired, you know, barked back, and... um you know, I was ended up being the first trade after that season ended because so we ended up losing to Houston. I was the first trade, like, at 12.01 at the trade. The trade started. You could start trading at 12. I was traded by 12.01 because me and Doc got into it. Well, I guess you went through some depression after yeah. dealing with Doc Rivers. Yeah. I would def- I, I would just say overall it was tough, you know, because although I was the one that left my ex and, and filed for divorce and was ready to move on, just the whole – overwhelming fact that like I don't have my family no more and I don't have my little guys no more that I woke up with every day and took to school and played with and you know were my life so you know splitting up with my ex I, I, it was definitely the right thing to do but just losing my boys in the process was tough you know what I mean so I was just going through a lot mentally and I was smoking a lot of weed you know to kind of keep me on edge lucky if it wasn't if I wasn't smoking who tell him you know what could have ended up happening because um, I really feel like although I had a few outbursts that if I didn't have the weed there would have been a lot more well, then you went to the Grizzlies. Mm-hmm. And that's when the whole Derek Fisher situation happened. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you and Derek Fisher had a relationship. Mm-hmm. You guys were friends. Yeah. Derek started dating Gloria mm-hmm. without you actually knowing. Mm-hmm. And I guess he actually started staying at your house mm-hmm. <laughs> with your sons yeah. in the house. Yeah. Then you found out one day. And you were roughly 95 miles away <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> when you found out. So this is, <clears throat> so this was where I was in Memphis. I had left for Memphis a little bit early um, just to get acclimated to my new teammates. We, as the Memphis Grizzlies, came back to Cali to have training camp in Santa Barbara. 
So this at this point, Glory and I are split up and it's a cool line of communication. You know what I mean? So we're cool. So I hit her up like, yo, I'm coming back for training camp. I haven't seen the boys for a minute. Can you bring the boys down Friday? Um, Saturday is my last day. And then I probably gonna get Sunday off so I can just go back to LA. You know what I mean? So I can just spend more time with the boys and she was cool with it. So she brings them, she brings the boys down Friday. We hang out, um, you know, get to see the boys. Saturday, the boys come for practice. My last day of practice and I coach like, okay, we're off Sunday. Um, you know, be back in Memphis by practices like, one o'clock, you know, so just be back in Memphis Monday morning. So um, I end up driving back to L.A. with Glory and Derek. <laughs> I <don't laughs> end up Glory. driving back to L.A. with Glory and the boys, <laughs> right. you know, so I'm driving, uh, you know, her truck home. We're not really talking too much. Like I said, we're cool, but it's just not, you know, like we're we're separated. We're not too, so we're, we're really not talking too much. Like she's on her phone and I'm just focusing, looking at my phone, talking to the boys a little bit. So we, we make a pit stop maybe like 45 minutes into the drive from Santa Barbara back to LA. Me and the boys get one thing, she gets another thing. So me and the boys are in the Escalade <laughs> watching, they're watching their little cartoon way in the back. And we're waiting for Glory to come back and she starts walking out of the place she got her food, not realizing that her Bluetooth comes on in the car. It's just like a movie. So her, her Bluetooth, so her whole conversation stops the boy's movie. They don't really pick up on it, but I'm just like, yo, I fucking know this voice, and I hear, baby, I miss you, and I can't wait to see you again, and we had so much fun in New York. I'm like, what the fuck? That's Derek's voice. So that, that's the first time I'm like, what the fuck is going on? So she gets back, so she's maybe 10 feet from the car, and I, I guess I'm just ice grilling her, that she like freezes like a deer in the headlights, like she knows by this time that her, her Bluetooth is on the car, so she gets back in the car, I'm like, who the fuck are you talking to? And she kind of freezes up, and obviously I'm not going to get super loud, because the boys are in the back, and I, I know it was Derek, and I said, and I was like, Derek, next time I see him, I'm going to beat the shit out of you, and it, and it hung up, and then the movie, and then the, <laughs> the boys' cartoon comes right back on. So needless to say, like, like I said, well, I wasn't really going to get into it with her, so it was dead silence like the next hour back home. She drops me off at my condo in Marina. I say bye to the boys, and then um, I'm just like, what the fuck is going on? So I'm thinking, I'm, I'm back in my place, I'm smoking, like, I'm going to whip this dude's ass. And it's not even so much, you know, just come to me. It's a hard situation, but come to me. But I end up finding more shit out. So then later that night, um, one of my twins hits me and he's kind of shook and he's like the rambunctious twin like he's the one that's always bouncing off walls and he kind of just his, his vibe is off and he's facetiming me and I'm like Carter what's up bro he shakes his head nothing I'm just like well, what's going on like why are you not talking he shakes his head nothing and then he puts his head down on the couch and puts a pillow over his face and in the phone he's like your friend Derek is over here and I'm like, no fucking way. Like, this is not real. I'm like, what? I was just like, I was like, where's your mom? And he's like, well, mommy, mommy, Isaiah, and, and, and Derek are uh, at the store or some shit like that. So when I hit my other twin, Isaiah, I'm like, hey, what's up, bro? I was like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, we just got done running errands. Um, we went to the store and to the airport. I'm like, oh, who did you pick up from the airport? And I think it was tough. So they're probably, what is this? They're probably six at this time. So it's almost like I'm asking him a question, but he doesn't want to tell on his mom. So I can tell him looking at his iPad, and he looks up at his mom like, can I answer this question? So I'm like, all right, let, let, let me talk. He's like, he's like, uh, we went to pick up mommy's friend, Derek. And I'm like, oh, so Carter said this my friend. And then Isaiah said this mommy's friend. So I was like, let me talk to your mom. And um, she takes the iPad, and she's like, I can't talk right now. I'm getting ready to have some people. I was like, man, fuck that. You know, like, we need to talk. So she goes in the garage and she's like, well, I wanted to tell you, but today happened. I didn't know how to tell you. I was like, no, nah, fuck that. I was like, you got this dude around my kids and you didn't tell me. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you got this dude in my house and you didn't tell me. Like, Which you're paying for, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Which makes it a little, right, right. A little stingier. Right. So I'm just like, and then, then, then she cops like a little attitude where like, you, well, you can't tell me who I can be with and hangs up on me. I'm like, mm, okay. But so by this time, like both my cars are already out in uh, Memphis, and this is pre-Uber for me. 
So like I have a little, my, my homeboy stays with me, but he's always gone though. His, his Bentley was downstairs, but I couldn't find the key. So I'm rummaging through the house. He's in Vegas like, bro, where are your keys? I need your keys. I need, I need to go somewhere. And I kind of briefly tell him I need to find your keys. So I finally found his keys. I go down the parking lot, put that bitch in reverse and he has a flat tire. Mm. And it's a Bentley, so I can't just like rough the shit up. So I'm just like, fuck, what do I do? So I say, fuck it. So I just drive it. I put the hazards on and drive like three miles an hour, like four blocks to the gas station, <laughs> put some air in the tire. I'm like, fuck it, I'm on. So I'm headed over there. So I think the whole situation was, I don't know where Kanye heard the story from, but everyone thought that once Kanye said 90 miles or 95 miles that I drove from Santa Barbara to Manhattan Beach when all I drove was from Marina Del Rey to Manhattan Beach. Okay, which is what, like 20 miles or something? It's 15 minutes. 15 minutes, right. Yeah. So well, I, it, I, it, I guess you were bumping Tupac the whole time? The whole time, man. So I'm bumping <laughs> Tupac. Probably hit, not the right, right type of music so at this I, point. So I, I, uh, I hit up Gilbert Arenas, and I'm just like, a, you know, kind of briefly give him what's going on. I was like, I'm probably, I'm probably going to need to get bailed out of jail tonight. He's like, what's going on? And I'm just like, you know, Derek's you know, and I kind of give him a little story. He's like, you know, Gil Gilbert's a motherfucking fire starter himself. So oh, he's he the was, instigator. He was gassed anyway. He's like, I he's got you. He's the guy you. that brings the gun into right, the locker room. Right, He's like, I got you. Whatever you need, you're good. <laughs> so I end up getting to the house, and I give him my keys back by this time, so the front door's locked. And I hear people in the backyard, and I smell the fire pit. So I hop the fence. And it's crazy too. Like, I'm in a, in a hoodie and in my beanie, and I'm walking along the side of the fence. And then this is probably. 10 o'clock at night by now. So you walk down the side of the house and then the backyard opens up a little bit. And as soon as I turn into the backyard, I see <laughs> Derek with his arm around Gloria. So I just fire on him, stuck him. Well, I guess you jumped over the gate. Yeah, I jumped over the back <laughs> fence because it was locked. <laughs> right, because Gilbert Arenas, I guess, did an Instagram post about it. Yeah. There <laughs> was no play by play. There was nobody stopped. Like, there was no... I was on another planet that night. So, so I ended up walking in there and then the first people I see are Glory and Derek. So I turn the corner, take off on him. Everybody starts screaming, and she had people over, a bunch of people over. So I hit him, he flies into, or falls into the sliding glass door. Okay, so you actually punch him in the face? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you connect? Mm hmm Okay. And hit him and knock him into the, to, to the sliding glass door. And then I'm jumped on by like three or four dudes. Everyone's screaming. All the girls are telling me to stop, Matt, stop, Matt. And I get these motherfuckers off my toe. Whoever gets in my way is getting hands. So <laughs> I get into the house and we get around this little island and we're kind of playing Tom and Jerry, him, no, we need to talk, we need to do this. Like, no, we don't need to do this. Everybody's screaming like, fuck that. You had your chance to talk to me, bro. Like, you know, we fighting. But does he have a bodyguard there? Yeah, so the bodyguard that was our bodyguard for the Lakers at the time. Oh, okay. so I I get to that part because he and I end up talking to him at the end. So I end up like making a move, and he runs some more and runs out to the front room, and we kind of square up again. I don't really get to get. I, I I'm thankful to this day that there were people there because if it was just me and him, I probably would have really hurt him. But every time we probably had three times where we kind of got up and I was trying to hit, but every time I was guys on my left arm, guys on my right arm pulling me back. So I never really, really got to really fire on him, fire on him like I wanted to, uh, luckily, because it, it could have got ugly. So long story short, we finally get broken up for, you know, the last time and someone grabs me with the firm grab and I turn around and that's our Lakers security guard. And he's just like, you know, I was like, uh, I apologize for the situation. You know, I heard someone just call the cops. I don't want you, want you to get in trouble. You should leave. So I left, and then the head security that kind of leases out these security guards hits me the next day like, yeah, he didn't know what to do. You know, he, he was in a bad place. He didn't know where Derek was going, and he was kind of just stuck there. But that's why he didn't get in and try to break it up, because he just, you know, he knew that he knew the situation was ill. So Right, because at the time, Derek was the coach. Coach uh, of the Knicks. Coach of the Knicks. So and he I guess left. he actually missed practice the next day. He missed, that's how serious it was. He missed... Uh, yeah, he missed. He he left training camp early to come allegedly go see his family, but was you know staying in my house with my family because I found it was a crazy story because so at the time Phil Jackson's son was my agent, mm. so I hit him up like, <laughs> yeah, I got in a fight and he's in Hawaii, so it's a couple hours later and he's like, what do you mean you got in a fight? Where are you at? What's going on? I'm like, I'm in L.A. I got in a fight. I might be getting in trouble. And he's like, who'd you fight? I'm like Derek Fisher. And he's like. How did you fight Derek? He's at, you know, they're, they're in training camp right now in New York. And he's and I'm like, no, nah, that motherfucker was at my house. He's like, oh, hold on, let me call my dad. So I guess he calls Phil and he got the story and then he made up some story how he needed to come to L.A. or whatever. And 
this shit just went down. Okay, did he get any punches in? Hell no. No. He was he didn't he didn't throw no punches and he was like screaming the whole time like stop and we need to talk. Let's talk this out. Let's do this. Let's do that. But no, he didn't he didn't throw no punches. Okay, well you got suspended for two, two games. Two games. Which was crazy because no one's ever got suspended, you know what I mean? It had nothing to do with it was wasn't really during the season yet. It had nothing to do with basketball. It was in my home. Yeah. And but like I said, there goes I think my reputation that I've built. Um Got me again. Right. Well, I guess the, the Players Association was trying to, to get that reversed. Mm -hmm. But then you went ahead and basically... Fuck myself. No, but just... <laughs> defended what you know. Just right. Because <laughs> I didn't feel, you know what I mean? I, I, I remember I did an interview with some shit like, you know, I was, you know, just kind of just keeping it real because you got to think about it. Like, motherfuckers get killed for situations like shit like that. If that's like some street shit, like if I wasn't no basketball player, like people get you like, bro, you were with my ex-wife and my kids. Like people have died for much less. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's how Floyd Mayweather got arrested. You know what Remember I mean? that whole thing? Yeah. That, that with it? He his baby mother had some dude at her house for a house that he was paying for, and he showed up. Yeah, and then it, boom, yeah, he it, went to it, prison. Right, it could it it could have got you know much uglier than it got, but it was just you know. So I, I'm automatically right back into the preseason, and people are interviewing him because it's slowly but surely starting to make its way out. And I just you know I, I said some shit like violence is never the answer, but sometimes it is, and I got fined. <laughs> I want to say was it another did it say fifty? Thirty five thousand. Thirty five thousand for that shit. But I mean it was, it was what it was, and 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 you know when I tell you I got so much love from outside people, from 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 referees, from general managers, <laughs> from owners, from players from other leagues were you know sending me messages uh, via social media. Man, we respect what you did. We would did the same shit. <laughs> Um, so, you know, fast forward, uh, he ends up getting fired from the Knicks. Um, you think because of that? I think that probably has something to do with it. I don't think they really wanted to make it that, but I think it definitely has something to do with it. Um, but fast forward, you know, they stay together. Um, my kids really like the dude and I'm thinking outside of just like, okay, well, I'm, I'm done with her and she could be much worse. So I'm at the point where, like, I'm not really tripping off dog no more. And then my boys are like, you know, Daddy, we really like Derek. You should be friends with Derek. Oh, yeah, she, she could be much worse. Yeah, you know what I mean? So Think like, about it. Right. She, yeah, that's what I'm saying. D, she could be with a D-boy right, right now. So that's I was, just yeah. like. So I wasn't, like, after my initial frustration, I wasn't really tripping no more. I'm like, he could be much worse. So my kids are kind of the ones that pushed me into, like, squashing everything with them. So it would be a situation before where we hadn't talked or said nothing. So he was with Gloria. but So he would come to the boys' games. And when I would come, he would look down the whole game or sometimes even leave. And I'm just like, this shit is stupid. So one day I just pull him to the side and I'm just like, yo, check this out, like. This is the, you know, it wasn't so much about you being with Gloria after we had separated. I, you know, that was kind of an ill move. But to me, you're, li you're, not, you're living in around my kids constantly, and you don't come to me about that. Like, you have twins that are a couple years older. Like, you know, how would you feel if your teammate was doing the same thing? And, you know, I, I understand. I apologize. And you guys are going through this, this, and that. And, you know, that's why, you know, I didn't talk to you. But... We kind of put that shit behind us and squashed it, and we're cool now. Well, they got engaged, right? Yeah. Are they married? Uh, I don't think they're married. A bunch of legal battles happened between you and Gloria, mm -hmm. which ultimately ended in you getting sole custody of the twins. Yeah. Which you never see a man get sole Ever. custody. Ever. Never. Mm -mm. My man, um, Kevin Federline, is mm -hmm. the only other man that I know that I've interviewed. D-Wade got him. Yeah, he, he got uh, the kids. D-Wade got his kids, too. But yeah, yeah it's very rare. And it's, it, I tell you, man, it's not set up for us to get our kids because it costs me a whole lot of money. You know what I mean? How much you spend? Legal man, fees. over a million. Whoa, 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 whoa! You spend a million dollars because there's in legal other costs. there's other legal costs that I'm currently, uh, you know, going through with her. But it's 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 definitely definitely getting right because. So we were already, so we were already, so the situation was where, you know, I was playing still. So we had worked out in mediation that once I retire, that we would go back to 50-50. So I retire in 2017 with the Warriors. I was living in the Bay. I'm like, all right, I'm going to find a place in L.A. And there's a whole bunch of stipulations or I got to live within a certain amount of fucking miles from her and from the school. So I apply to everything, comply to everything. And then I come back and I'm just like, yo, like, I'm talking to her like, yo, what's up with the 50-50? You know, I'm back here now. You know I'm a good dad. And she's like, what, 50-50? Like, no, we're not doing 50-50. We got to go to court for that. And I'm just like, right. all right, man. So within the midst of waiting for our court date, an incident happens at their school where 
you know, I go to pick the boys up and um, it was right before a holiday weekend. It was a three day weekend. So I'm there early. I'm always waiting in front of their class and, and one of my twins comes out and we don't know where the other twin is. So I'm just like, well, you know, maybe he went up to the uh, parent pickup, go see if he's up there. So he takes off, I'm walking behind and he comes back. He's like, yeah, um, Isaiah's up there, but mommy's up there too. And I'm like, why is she here? So I mean, I go up there and I talk to her and by the time I, uh, get back, like Carter runs back and she's telling him to get in the car. So Isaiah's already in the car sitting behind Gloria. Carter gets in the, the middle area in the, in the second row and sits in, this, in, the, in the thing and shuts his door. So I walk around to the passenger window, open up the door and I'm just like, you know, what are you doing here? You know, it's my weekend. She's like, no, it's my weekend. I'm taking the kids. I'm like, no, you're not. And then the boys are like, no, mom, this is, it's daddy's weekend. It's this whole ordeal. So I pick the boys' iPads up off the front seat and I'm like, Let's go, fellas. So I'm so like I said, I'm in the I'm in the front passenger door. I open up the back door and walk around that door and Carter jumps out. I reach across the car because Isaiah's sitting behind the driver, which is Gloria, to reach for Isaiah's hand and all of a sudden she slams like she puts the car in reverse and like the car door hits me. Um, I lose contact with Isaiah, I kind of stumble for a second. Isaiah falls back in the seat. My girl, like, what the fuck are you doing? She tries to drive the car she as you're like push, halfway in the car. She tries to put the car in reverse and back out. So keep in mind that so it's, this is two lanes of traffic at three o'clock where their other kids are being picked up. Kids are walking, other cars are moving, all this kind of shit. Crazy. So I'm like, yo, like, what the fuck? Like, what are you doing? And um, so I reach back in and grab Isaiah. And when I'm helping Isaiah get out this time, she grabs his arm and backs up again. And I'm like, what the fuck? So I kind of yank Isaiah from her. As Isaiah's coming out, the car door hits his arm and he starts crying. And I'm just like, yo, like, what? Like, what are you doing, yo? Like, what the fuck is going on right now? So the, both boys are crying. Um, I take my, put my arm around both boys and we're walking back to where I parked, which was by the beginning of the gate. So I guess she hops. I find all this out in court. She hops out the car, shuts her door and comes flying around the bend and coming at me when I, so I put the boys in the car. I'm about to sit in my car and I see her coming down <laughs> the fucking school parking lot like fast. And I'm like, oh shit, here she we go. She tried to hit you. No, I was already, I was in a place where she couldn't hit me, but okay. I just seen her coming fast. So I hop in my car cause there's no telling like what she might try to do or she might try to, I don't know what she's going to do. So I'm just like, oh, she's tripping. So I hop in my car real quick. She <laughs> parks like she's, I reversed in. So I'm, I'm nose out ready to get out and she slams on the brakes right in front of my car gets out the car, bangs on the window, like, give me my fucking kids. I'm like, yo, like, it's my weekend. What are you doing right now? So luckily there's no, so there's no car next to me in this next lane. So I, so obviously I don't open up doors. So I try to like six point turn real quick and get around her out of the lane because there's an open lane next to me and she reverses and nearly hits my car. So I'm just like, yo, like, all right. So I stop, I get out of the car. I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, you're not leaving with my kids. So obviously it's a, it's a commotion by now. So parents have called the cops, uh, the head of the school and the head security come up to me and ask me what's going on. And I tell them, and luckily I have my paperwork with me. I'm just like, you know, in writing, it's my weekend, it's my weekend. here it yeah. goes. You know what I mean? So they look at it, they go tell her and she's like, oh, we don't go by that shit no more. And it's my weekend. <laughs> like, yeah, this girl is tripping. So we wait like 30 minutes. Cops come, cops get there, they come to me first, you know, ask me the story, I told them what I just told you, <laughs> and then, uh, then I show him the paperwork. He's like, oh, I'm not going to read all this paper, show me exactly where it says it's your time. Open up the page, show him right where's my time, he's like, wait here. Goes to talk to her, they get into like a verbal altercation, and next thing I know, like, I see him walking her back to the cop car to sit her down. So he comes Did back you to me. Arrested or no? No, not yet. He comes back to me. He's just like, "Why? Well, you know, I wanted her to cool off. You know what I mean? She was, you know, she wasn't compliant. She was being disrespectful." I was like, "All right." He's like, "Let me talk to you." So I get outside real quick, and then another officer comes and asks the boys what happened. Like he tells them. So then they, the officers talk again, and they come back to me, and they're just like, "You know, this is a felony child endangerment situation." I'm just like, "Yeah." He's like, "Well, she's gonna get arrested." I'm like, oh shit, okay. 
I'm just like, all right, well, when are you going to do it? And I'm just like, well, can you let me leave first so the boys don't see their mom get arrested? So, yeah, so they made her move the car. Me and the boys bounce. Uh, she gets arrested. So, like I said, keep in mind, we're already going to court in a couple months for just for my 50-50. So my lawyers tell me, just like, well, if you ever want a full custody of your boys, now is the time. And, you know, outside of Gloria and I's beef, like, she's always been a really good mom. You know what I mean? So I was just like, uh, you know, she, I'm, I'm to the belief where, you know, the, the, the boys need both of us. And they're just like, you know, this is just a great chance. Think about it. And I'm just like, all right, fuck it. Let me get, I want, I want full custody of the boys in. So we go through this and spend, you know, a bunch of money. And uh, I end up winning full custody of the boys. And that was it. Right, because when you're going through it with your ex-wife in a situation like this, you actually have to pay her legal bills Oh, man, I had to well. pay everything. I had so, to pay so, everything. So you guys are fighting out in court, and you're paying both. You're paying her lawyer her to lawyers, try to take your children away from right, you. Right, paying her lawyer, my lawyer, and then she keeps taking me back for, like, bogus low charges, knowing that every time I'm going to have to pay for the situation. So Twice. I end up getting a restraining order against her, you know, just to kind of calm things down. Um explain to the boys you know what's going on and I'm, I'm always very transparent and upfront and they're to the age now I think they were nine at the time or no yeah about nine or eight they knew what was going on and it was just a situation where it was unfortunate because although I was glad to have my kids I saw the 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 impression that left on them you know what I mean right because the whole relationship just seems so volatile right but the one thing we were good at was we were able to shield the kids from it it, it is rocky as rocky as it was, we were able to shield the boys from it. And that was the first time they really had to see... Actually see it, yeah. Yeah. Right, because back in 2014, there was something about her forging a signature on a $150,000 loan. Then there was, uh, in 2018, you sue her for allegedly embezzling 300000 I guess transferring some money out of your bank account... This is just so that's why I say there's craziness. a bunch there's a bunch of lawyer fees that are being paid. I mean that's just all in the mix. You know that's still a you know an ongoing process that I really can't speak on. Right. But it was a part of the overall like I'm just in court with this girl left and right for for crazy stuff. You know what I mean? And, and the whole time it's just like it's taking a toll on my kids and and I see it and and, and you and it, and it hurts me and, and it hurts me. Yeah, my pockets. You know her. You know what I mean for her to to be a full time mom and then you know unfortunately have her kids taken away and like I said I'm not. People may think I'm an asshole, but I, I'm really not. I'm really logi logical and, and reasonable, and I'm thinking like, like the boys need both of us, and this is just a bad look. You know, so for a while it was visits. You know, monitored visits for her and for her. Yeah, it just got back to the point where. We turned, the, you know, we, we kind of just, we didn't talk. We talked through an app, and it was, I think at that time is when we both really, really put the boys first, um, even though it was always my main objective. <clears throat> and <clears throat> we got to a point where, uh, you know, earlier, or I want to say right before the summer, um, you know, I just, I asked the kids, I'm just, because it, it was a situation where I was getting the boy, I had the boys, she had the boys Wednesday and every other weekend. So she had the boys eight days a month. And I, I just asked the boys going towards the end of school, I'm just like, what's your favorite, you know, rotation between me and mom? Because they try to give you like a one, two, three, or one, two, two, three, some shit like that. And the boys are just like, you know, we like the summer schedule, which is week on, week off. So, I, you know, like I said, there had been some peace between her and I. And we went back in and we ended up doing a um, week on, week off now. So that's where we currently are. And, and currently... You know, I wouldn't say we're cool, but there hasn't been any drama. You know, like I said, it's just exchanges and, and, and things are finally smooth, I would say, for the first time in like five years. But you still have sole custody? I still have custody. It just the visitation is 50 mm. 50. Got it. You know, you, you've gone through so much public drama with, with your kid's mother. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at what's happening these days, like Boogie Cousins goes and mm -hmm. threatens to kill. Uh, his baby mother, mm -hmm. and she records it. And, and I remember I talked to John Sally about this, right? And he and he's kind of pointing out, he's like, well, look how she's hyping it up. Look how she's pushing his buttons to make him say something crazy. That's the key word right there. Yeah. Because you're not going to be recording unless you know you're going to say something that's exactly. going to make him say something. Exactly. Threatening to shoot her in the head. And puts it out. <laughs> 
Because I think like it was something like he was getting married and he wanted like his child at his wedding and his baby mother didn't want, you know, it was basically just being petty, I guess. Mm -hmm. So she was taping it and she knew she was antagonizing him. Mm -hmm. And she knew that he would say whatever yeah. is going to be outrageous. She knew it was going to happen. Yeah. So she, So that's premeditated. And what he said, because apparently the, the whole story was he was getting married and he wanted his daughter. Yeah, I was to there. there. I was at the wedding. You were at the wedding. Mm -hmm. so okay. He wanted it. Was it his son or his daughter? He wanted daughter. one of them, and it wasn't his day, and she wouldn't allow him to come she just for that day. Him. Just yeah. for that day. Yeah. And and John Sally went through something interesting. I mean, something similar, mm -hmm. where his daughter, he wanted her, his daughter to attend the wedding, and mm -hmm. the mother was being petty and. Mm -hmm. And he said, I could relate, you no, know, the wanting no, to shoot your baby no mother question. in the head. I, I could, you know, he wasn't right. going to do it, but he's like, I could relate. But like I said, I think, you know, when people, they take, I don't know, we live in a different time. You know they, what I mean? They but weaponize we, the kids. Right. So, oh, I mean, there's, women are great at that. And, and like you said earlier, just pushing buttons. So, you know, I think women realize, or some women realize that, you know, their last core to our heart is the connection we have to our children. So they use them as bait or they use them as checks or they use them as, pawns in a game and and it's not that so it, it's tough you know when you're a public figure um people think oh you got money you can do the now it's not set up for us to win it's not no matter because I, like i said if i if i had told you a, the whole story that went down with my ex how i won full custody of my boys and now we're back to 50 50 within a year if i did that shit to her hit her with the car door hit my son with the car door like I would have went to jail for a certain amount of time, mm -hmm. no question. There was no fucking way I could see and my no kids. No custody. No. Maybe way. supervised. No, once or twice right. a month. There's no way I'd be able to see my kids by myself. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like I said, it's not, it's not built for us. You know yeah. what I mean? The system's Especially if not you have built. money. Right. So it's just it, it's a tough situation, and it was it was tough because Boogie's you know like a little brother to me, and to see all the, the hardship he's experienced on the court, and then to to really see him at his wedding day and how happy he is, and his vibe and his energy and his glow is great, and then to find out you know what I mean that there's, for one day the ex wouldn't let the kid come to the yeah. wedding, which is it, it's just stupid. Yeah, there was like a warrant out for his arrest. I think he had to turn himself in. It was ridiculous. It was a disaster. And, and what women don't realize is when you fuck our money up, like your money is fucked up too. You know what I mean? So if right. you, you cut, you know, if you cut the cow off, you know, you get us in trouble, or we get in trouble dealing with your bullshit. Like your money is gonna change too. So it's yeah. it's unfortunate, man. And there's there's plenty of situations like that. And you know, I, I I've talked to the NBA several times, the Players Association, about really arming the current players with their rights and understanding what is domestic violence on their part, and and and, and as small as disturbing our peace of mind is domestic violence, you know, yeah. when the women use kids and as pawns and just, you know, disrupt us and, and disrupt us in, in our environment. That's a form of domestic violence. And I think that, you know, guys need to learn their rights and, and what to do and what not to do because it was completely new to me. You know, there was times where I didn't see my boys for a few months and, you know, they would miss plane flights purposely and I, like their cell phones, I couldn't get a hold of them. And it's just like, this is crazy because you're mad at me. You're fucking up a situation with, with the children. And like I said, my situation is not unique. You know, a lot of people go through it, so it's just unfortunate. Do you ever take a step back and say, look, I grew up in a dysfunctional household where my parents were constantly fighting, mm -hmm. getting arrested for domestic mm -hmm. violence and, you know, a bunch of crazy shit. Here I am as an adult. Same thing. Doing the same thing. Crazy. I, you know, you try to. Um but it's tough, man. Like once the kids are involved, you know, there was never, although my childhood was crazy, like there was never like my mom was leaving or my dad was leaving. We had to choose sides. Like our fucked up shit was just in front of us every single day. You know what I mean? So there was never that part of it. And, you know, so when, when kids are involved and you don't get to see them and you don't get to talk to them, there's so many deadbeat dads out there. And I really feel like it pisses me off when there's moms out there that don't allow the father to be a father, you know, especially when the father wants to be. You know, there's such a portrayal of deadbeat black dads or deadbeat athletes and all this kind of shit and there's a lot of guys out there that want to be you know to be fathers and and the women make it really hard on them what happened between you and mayweather <laughs> what was that about he says some slick shit to me um, at, a Clippers game? at a Clipper game. So he was a Clipper fan. And then I remember one time Cleveland came in and he just flipped script and he was just pom poming for uh, LeBron and them. And I'm just like, what the fuck? Like you're pom poming for us every, you know, all these games. And now you're pom pom for them. And then he says some slick shit like. What did he say? 
keep talking shit, I'm gonna fuck your wife, or I'm gonna fuck this, I'm gonna fuck that. And I <laughs> said, I said, go ahead, because I fuck your bitches, I ain't gotta pay them. You know mm. what I mean? That's what I said to him. So there was just like a quick, like, <clears throat> but since then we've been cool and we've seen each other and we've talked and it's kind of water under the bridge. But like, I'm someone that's like, I'm fully aware of my surroundings when I play and I think interacting with people makes the situation better. And it was just a situation where like, I just shut the shit up real quick with my comeback. That was it. <laughs> Well, uh, you leave the Grizzlies, and now you go to Sacramento Kings, mm -hmm. which is your 39th team, I think, right. at this point. <laughs> In a short amount of time. You stay there for a year. No. Less than a year? Sacramento? Yeah, Sacramento Kings. No, I was there until the trade deadline. They traded Boogie. Oh, okay. So I signed a three-year contract um, at the beginning of the season, figuring I'm just going to retire with the Kings. All right, the then Kings. you got waived, yeah. So what happened was they traded Boogie at the All-Star break, and I think we were on the, you know, the, the, the fringe of possibly sliding in the playoffs, being an A seed. It's an, a new arena in my hometown. We're trying to bring some excitement back, and they trade Boogie, and like, I'm just like, we have no shot now. So I talked to the GM, and you know they're trying to rebuild. I'm to a point where I don't have rebuilding time in my career. So we, you know, I get a, a situation where they, I get them to let me go, and then like, a week later or a week and a half later, um, KD goes down and I end up going to the Warriors. So here you are at the end of your career. You're how old at this time? 36. 36 years old. Mm -hmm. No rings. Mm -hmm. Had you been to the finals before? Mm -mm. Eastern no. Conference Finals. Yeah. Never been to the finals. You've been to the playoffs mm -hmm. and everything, but never to the finals. Yeah. And you join Golden State. Mm-hmm. With Kevin Durant on it, mm -hmm. and uh, you end up winning yeah. your first ring. Yeah, that's a bittersweet. On, on the final team that you ever play right. on in the final year mm -hmm. of your career. Mm -hmm. Well, I made it the final year of my career. I still had two more years to be in paid. Um, but that was a crazy situation because I go in there for Katie, um, has a knee injury. I come in and like the first game I play like 25 minutes, so I'm constantly in the rotation whether I'm starting or coming off the bench. You know, I'm I'm, I'm definitely contributing, and it kind of came full circle. You know what I mean? So I start thinking like now I'm here, like this is full circle. That even though this is not where I started my career year wise, this is where my career started as far as yeah, playing. Your first real contract, right, yeah. You know what I mean? So it's just like this shit is dope, and I'm gonna win a championship too, and that might be it. That's what I'm telling myself right when I get there. Like let's just go out there and have fun and just see what the fuck happens. So the game, KD comes back like a week before the playoffs, like I almost break my ankle, like severe, like I don't miss games for injuries. The only time I miss games is when I'm suspended. So it's a severe ankle sprain, like I almost broke it. And I'm just like, fuck. So I never even get a chance to really play with KD. We played maybe a couple minutes on the court together and I got hurt. So even though we were on the team, we never really got a chance to play together. So we go to a situation where I'm hurt, I'm out. I'm, Try to make, try to make, uh, try to go in the first round. Can't cut. Try to go in the second round. Still don't feel it. So I start feeling good towards the end of the second round. But by this time, we're seven and zero. You know what I mean? There's already rhythm. There's already a rotation. There's already chemistry. And I'm like, fuck. So at the same time, Steve Kerr is dealing with some back ailments. So he's not really coaching. So we're back to Mike Brown coaching the Laker Mike Brown that I have where we butted heads and mm. he wanted to play somebody over me and was the reason why I left the Lakers and went to the Clippers in the first place. So I'm like, fuck. So it was, it was fucked up where I would get thrown in, like just thrown in the mix. Like I'm 36 years old coming off an injury and I'll play like, won't play the whole first half and he'll toss me in for a couple minutes in the third quarter or the next game toss me in for a couple minutes in the fourth quarter. Not really able to get no rhythm. So I'm just like, fuck it. So instead of like really getting mad and, and, and being pissed, I'm just like, I'm just going to, you know, be a great support system. I'm going to go out here and, and, and help these guys in practice. I'm going to see stuff on the side, you know, talk to players on the side. If if I see them going through things, I'm really just being that vet that I, that, that I had to be um, because kind, I was like a run our test. Run right. When well, he joined yeah. the Lakers. Yeah. Well, wasn't really getting a chance. You know, like I said, I, like I said, I, I wanted to play very bad. I wanted to be out there. But like I said, I, I'm someone that understands the game. I've always been a team player and, and the rotation was set. And they were on their way to the finals, so it's just like, fuck it, I'm not really going to get to play, so let me just buy into to, to being a veteran and, and being a good president and a good energy. 
and that's what I did, and we ended up winning a championship. But when people ask me, like, I really don't count that as a championship, you know, although... Because you didn't really play? Because I didn't play, man. Yeah. Like, to me, nothing my whole career, if you look at my career, has been a grind, and nothing's ever been handed to me. And I really felt like, okay, well, shit, I'm at a chance. I'm going to be in the finals. I'm going to be out there being able to guard LeBron and Kawhi and really help and contribute. And then when I got hurt and I wasn't able to, like, I feel like, damn, like my culmination of my career, my hard work, I earned this ring, but I wasn't out there really sweating with these guys and, and making an effect in the game. So you'll never hear me like call myself a champ or catch me with my ring on. And to be honest with you, I think the, my ring is still with the Golden State Warriors PR director. Um, yeah, I left it at the arena. Really? And I just hadn't got back to getting it. But You never got your ring? I, I mean, it, I had it. I seen it. But they gave it to me in a presentation. And I put it in back in like a storage room. And then I ended up leaving before. And it was just a cat and mouse of being able to like get and connect and get the ring. And so the Warriors still have my ring. But I think the best part about that whole experience was my boys got to ride along. So Coach Kerr was super cool. He let the Twins fly on the team playing with us and practice with us and, well, and then the parade in the parade yeah, yeah you know so they and, and when we won the championship they're right up on stage with Steph and KD you know trying to hold the MVP in a championship trophy like everyone's hitting me like yo we see your boys all over ESPN so I thought that was the dopest thing was my kids got to experience you know being around a championship team and, and these players and I actually ended up getting them replica rings for their birthday you know what I mean so nice. they were the only nine-year-old with championship <laughs> rings so although it, it wasn't really my storybook ending um, it was just an ending where okay you you you're on a championship team uh, you know you just finished you know 15 years of professional basketball I'm still scheduled, you know, like I'm still being paid for another two years. I can keep playing or I can just see what's next. And, uh, you know, at that time, it was still kind of rocky between my ex and I as far as seeing my boys. So I'm just like, you know, I want to start spending more time with my kids and, and see what's next. So I just, I retired after that. You retired after 16 years of professional basketball. 15. 15? Mm-hmm. Sorry. Mm-hmm. From 14 years in the NBA. Mm -hmm. You played for 10 teams mm -hmm. during that time. Well, eight teams and I think two teams tour. Two teams twice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, quite a journey. It was a, it was a roller coaster, man. And, yeah. and I think, you know, I, would I like to stay on a, a one team or two teams and, 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 you know, rode it out there? But my journey was never a normal journey. You know what I mean? I had to scratch and claw to, to, to get in this league. And I think the... And to stay in this league. Right. The <laughs> one-year auditions. Every year I was on an audition, not only for the team I was playing, but, uh, you know, yeah. other suitors. And I think that my reputation sometimes preceded me and gave me a certain reputation. But if you ask anyone I've ever played with, from the stars to, you know, the role players, that, you know, I was a solid teammate and someone they would always go to war with. And um, I bounced around, but it was, like I said, it, for someone who wasn't supposed to make it and to be able to play that long and, and, and do what I did and, and make the money I made, like, to me, that shit was a win. Well, I had Jalen Rose on my show recently. And you, you start playing, I guess, the year after Michael Jordan retired. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you guys never got to play mm -hmm. against each other. So I had him give me his top 10 NBA players of all time. I'm going to read you his list. Okay. From 1 to 10. Okay. Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Bill Russell. Magic Johnson. LeBron James. Larry Bird. Kobe. Wilt, Shaq, and Oscar. He put Kobe at what, seven or eight? Kobe six. No, oh, sorry, seven. Seven. Kobe he actually gave, put Bird over Kobe, Kobe, which is what kind of... Kobe gave him 81. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> no, Jay Rose is my guy, though. Did you ever see that commercial? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want 81 yeah. olives. <laughs> I don't... To me, I, obviously, I, I miss Jordan. Um... But to me, there's no – Jordan is one and Kobe's 1B. And that's mm. no knock on LeBron. I think LeBron is right there. But just the killer instinct Kobe had, um, the way he uh, attacked the game. And it's the same thing that made Kobe great that people knock LeBron for. But LeBron is, is a different type of player. LeBron is the right play type player. Like if he has to pass for the last shot, he's willing to do that for the betterment of the team. Yeah, Michael Jordan's not passing nothing. Kobe's not passing nothing. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's a situation where like I personally, I would rather ride like uh, we're going to sink or, you know, sink or swim with our best player, you know, with the ball in his hands. And, and that's the kind of mentality that 
like I like, even though I wasn't that type of player, like I wanted to play with someone like that. So like I said, it, it's to me, it, it's MJ, Kobe, LeBron, Magic, Shaq, Kareem, um, Larry. What is that? Seven. Mm-hmm. Um, Bill Russell on your list? Yeah, Bill Russell's like nine. Wilt's ten. Who can I be? Eight. Yeah, we need one more. Who's eight? I don't know. You forget about like the. Maybe an Oscar. I don't like to disrespect. Like I don't ever like to compare eras or or disrespect eras. But it it just seems from you know knowing basketball and watching basketball. The reason why I put Wilt a little further down the list and Bill Russell a little further down the list is because their average players back then were not good players. Well, yeah, the not, average, not like today. Yeah, like the average players were not good right. players. Like yeah, they also weren't as tall back right. then. Right, smaller, and these guys yeah. are just big, dominant guys. So that's why I always give the nod to current players because they're playing like the game is so far advanced. Well, it's international now. Now they're picking up guys in remote parts of Africa and Seven weird foot, European countries. They can countries run and, and jump and shoot. China. There were no you know, Chinese players. In, you know, back in the day, guys then. can only dribble with one hand. You know what I mean? You see that <laughs> magical picture of Bob Cousy dribbling through everyone with just his right hand. Well, you know well, guys, I mean? guys would have day jobs. Yeah, it was, it was a different time. They would go play time. the NBA on the weekends and right. then go back to their post office right. job. and then. So I think yeah. you always got to credit the, the older players for the, the, the com- continuing to help grow the game. But I think in the all time, and this is not to, you know, you know I mean, obviously I am who I am. I'm a role player, and, and not to, to to discredit any of the greats, but I don't put any of the older greats in front of the younger, so to speak, greats, is because the competition was way different when they played. So I agree. that's that's why I get like the the back top ten is where you'll catch a Wilt or a Bill Russell for me, because Wilt wasn't going against Patrick Ewing and David Robinson and Tim Duncan and Rick Smiths and Mark like Eaton like big ass guys that are as big as them you know what i mean like yeah. Shaq was yeah. you know so it was just more of a to me it was the, the average player and and, and and the levels were just different to me well our friend john sally who actually helped set up this interview uh he said something that kind of pissed everybody off he said that in terms of players that he's played with himself he said pippen is more skilled than michael jordan See, the, the funny thing is, I think Scotty is more skilled than all of them. Scotty Pippen is probably the most skilled player I've ever played with. Really? Yeah. And his hands come to his shit. <laughs> okay? Standing straight up. But he just happened to be playing with Michael Jordan, so. Well, this is the deal. Michael would turn him, Scotty would get the steal. Mm, tough. And he was on those teams. He was on those teams. In terms of skill level. He's Pippen a more was a, skilled player than Jordan. I could put Pippen at eight, to be honest with you. I loved Pippen. I loved Grant Hill. Grant Hill would have been a top ten player if he didn't get hurt. Penny Hardaway would have been a top yeah. ten player if he didn't get hurt. I asked Jalen Rose about this, and he said that John Sally needs a drug test. <laughs> <laughs> he said there's no way yeah. that Pippen is better than Jordan. But. Yeah, I don't think he was better, but I think he was right there. You know yeah. what I mean? There is no Michael Dynasty, obviously, without Pippen. True. You know, and, and that... And that you know, yeah, that's true. He's been there the whole time. No question. Yeah, Rodman you know came I mean? at one point, but they'd already been on a roll. When Mike had bounced, like Pippen was in, in the running for MVP that year. Pippen was killing that year. You know what I mean? So Pippen was. I don't ever think he gets the credit he deserves because he was always, you know, Robin to to Mike's Batman. But they were a hell of a duo, man. And, and uh, I could definitely see Pippen. Yeah, Pippen could be in my top ten. He could be eight. Yeah. Well, you said that you want to be a billionaire by 50. Mm -hmm. You got 11 years left. Got a lot of work to do. Uh, You actually own the life rights to Suge Knight? No. So I was a part of a a project that we did did have the rights to uh, through his niece. Uh, but it just kind of started getting messy the further and further it went down. I uh, ended up hooking them up with... Messy uh, business with Suge Knight? Really? Right, I've never heard of that before. I ended up hooking them up <laughs> with, uh, with Mark Kenton, the creative power, and, and, and had these guys all excited about doing the story. And then, you know, once this shit got real, there was, you know, so-and-so needs this amount of money and so-and-so needs that amount of money. And now someone else is, because we didn't get this, someone else has the right. So it just kind of got messy. Uh, so I just respectfully had to, to to back away from that project. Yeah, I mean, I've done so many Tupac-related interviews, and people ask why I don't interview Suge Knight, 
and I'm just like, I'm good. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, it's, uh, it, it, he it's knows a, exactly who I am. Right. It's, it's a crazy uh, situation, man. You know what I mean? And, yeah, and, and I just, to be just, such a fan of that era, I was so excited because well, I'm a huge You Tupac, have Tupac on your Tupac. hand. I got Tupac and Nipsey on my hand. So, yeah. so I mean, huge, yeah. huge, uh, huge Pac fan. And, you know, and so to, to, to be able to possibly have a, a chance to, you know, tell that story was, was really exciting to me, but it didn't happen. Okay. Well, what are your other business, businesses right now? Uh, I have a cannabis company that uh-huh. I'm a part of. Um, okay, I'm a so part you owner. Common with John. <laughs> right. Uh, of Seven Leaves is cultivation uh, up in Sacramento. Uh, I think by the end of the year, we'll have a thousand lights. So we're making moves with that. And then I'm also launching my own brand outside of that called Swish. So we'll be doing a health and wellness uh, CBD side of Swish and then a THC side of Swish. So really a big advocate for cannabis and, and, and the benefits it has um, on not only athletes, but everybody in general. Uh, Gilbert Arenas is in that. Uh, yeah, I think a lot. I mean, a lot of guys are in, in that space. game, too. You know, it, a lot it's, of people, uh, yeah. You know, it's our equivalent of, of the gold rush or prohibition right now, and, and cannabis is something that I've been smoking since I was 14, and it, it's always been a vital part of my life, and, and really, I owe a lot to it, uh, you know, for the shit it got me through, mentally, physically, emotionally. Mm. Um, so, you know, post-career, I really want to be a part of something that helps change the regulations in sports. So I'm working with UCLA on a cannabis research program. Ah, so so players could legally smoke. Yeah, which right technically now they, can. they should be able to. They right? Should if you, be able to. If you're to, a I mean, California, if, you, if you're a Laker, why would you not be able to, to smoke weed? Like, be, uh, I just think it's bigger because it's not legal everywhere. But I think you know, obviously, these leagues are listening, and, and the fact that they'll pump us full of any opioid to get us back on the court field or, you know, baseball diamond is crazy, but then want to fine us and suspend us for, for smoking weed. So yeah. it's a situation that's it is very outdated. I think it's the stigma that, that, that comes with cannabis that, you know, the, the high people aren't functioning people and they're losers and it leads to other drugs. There's all kinds of bullshit ass stigmas that come with the drug, but I want to continue. And I don't even like to call it a drug. I call it medicine. I want to yeah. continue to help, you know, raise awareness and, remove the stigma and remove the word high from it and explain the education on the beneficial side. Well, you also have the rights to Huey P. Newton. So I was uh, a part Black of that Panther one too. Story. Yeah. So this whole thing is like, you know, I'm someone that was used my basketball platform to meet a lot of people and open a lot of doors and, and really kept good connections with people. But I realized that, you know, transitioning in business, you know, you're either people really fuck with you because you did something or they're looking at you like, oh, this motherfucker thinks he could do anything because he played basketball. So I always try to surround myself with, if I'm moving into a business with people that know a lot about that space. So I had teamed up with a group of guys uh, that had the rights um, and that, you know, it was a, fr- some, a guy and his college roommate had wrote the script and was really excited. But then, you know, once we got to reading the script and, and seeing it, it wasn't really up to, to standards. And to me, like, I'm not going to put no bullshit out because it's going to be my name that's yeah. going to attach to it. And you don't want to fumble right. a, Black especially, Panther, you know, a Black Panther story. Especially in this climate and what we're about. You know, To me, that has to be done right by the right people. Um, I tried to help bring some other people along. Uh, the current people that I was working with didn't really want to go that way. They kind of wanted to keep it in-house and, and do what they did. So I had to step away from that project too. So I had my hands on, you know, the Suge Knight story at one point and and the Huey P. Newton story at one point. But, you know, I had to respectfully back away from both projects because um, I just didn't feel they were right. Well, let me get your take on this. This is a little bit left field, but it's something that I've been covering recently. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did a tweet about a week ago or so. And I said, uh, I fully support reparations for African Americans, possibly in the form of a free college education. And I got Damn attacked right. for sure. for weeks over this. People were telling me I have no right to even comment on it. Uh, you know, we, we need to talk about cash and land, not, not education. Education is not going to solve anything and so forth. You were someone who has an education. You went to UCLA, which was considered a top school. I went mm-hmm. to Cal myself, so, mm-hmm. so I understand a, a UC education. Mm-hmm. My, I would not be remotely as successful as I am right now if I didn't go and get a computer science degree from UC mm-hmm. Berkeley. I use it in my business every single day. Mm-hmm. Over the course of a, of a lifetime, the average college graduate makes a million dollars more than the average high school graduate. Mm-hmm. So when I p- say that statement to you, how do you feel about it? <sighs> We're in an upside down. like The world's upside down right now. We're in a crazy political climate and just an overall 
time to be alive is, is crazy. So, you know, the reparation thing, there should be, will there ever be, I doubt it. Uh, to me, there'll always be racism. Uh, you know, racism is something that's taught that you're not born with. And, um, you know, I just think that we have to just learn to maneuver within that. Um, it, it's unfortunate when, you know, the person in power encourages, you know, and, 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 and tries to make a point to that there's levels that, you know, a certain race is bigger and better and, and, and one race is very bad people and criminals and, you know, all these stereotypes. And it's unfortunate because there's a lot of people that still feel that way. And you see, you yeah. see that on a daily basis. Because you're mixed. Yeah. You have a white mother mm-hmm. and a black father. And you were raised with both of them. Mm-hmm. So you got to see both. Mm-hmm. A person sees you in America, they'll look at you as a black man mm-hmm. because this whole one drop rule bullshit. But, I learned, but the reality, you're just right. as much white as you are black. Yeah, but you know, it's funny you say that because I, they make you pick. Mm. You can't be one of, you can't be, you can't be, I mean, I'm proud of both. No one makes me do anything, but I realized I was a black man when my high school was vandalized by the KKK when I was in high school. Oh, wow. Um, you know, this this white kid was messing with my sister, calling her nigger, spitting her hair. I happened to see him one day after school, beat his ass. And then got suspended for a week. But when we went in there, we're just like, you know, this kid is constantly harassing my sister, making racial slurs, spit at her, and you don't do nothing. So I finally handle it, and now you suspend me. Uh, no, you know, this kid's dad's a big-time lawyer in the city. He wasn't raised like that. So basically, like, they didn't believe us. And then, you know, during my suspension, the school was vandalized. The bathroom was burned down. Swastikas everywhere. Mannequins with my football jersey. Die, you fucking nigger. Really? Everywhere. You know, it made, it made national news. Um... The, the NAACP came down to Sacramento, and I think that's when I realized that even though I'm very proud to be mixed, um, that society saw me as a black man. And I, I've always carried myself as such. You know, like you said, even though I'm just as much Italian as I am black, my skin is not to, you know, my skin, I'm, I'm Don Brown. You know what I mean? So I'm looked at, people always think I'm Mexican to begin with, but, you know, <laughs> I'm, a, you know, I'm, I call myself a black man because that's how I've been treated. And, and, and I've seen racism from police officers. I've seen racism, you know, at my high school. I've been stereotyped several times. So it's just that I identify more with black than I do with the, the, the white population. Yeah. And this is a very uniquely American thing. So, for example, when you go to, like, Brazil, you would not be considered black. You'd be moreno. Hmm. They have their own, like, kind of classification mm-hmm. for it. But not in America. No. Now you're black. Mm-hmm. I don't care no. how white you are. <laughs> and, it, and it's hard, too. Uh, I, I think it's different now because there are so many mixed kids. But when you're, when you're mixed at a younger age, like, you're never white enough and you're never black enough. So that's mm. why I really grew up fighting. You know, your dad's, my dad's, they call you nigger fight. So I was, you know, as much as I wanted to play with these kids and be friends with them, they just didn't see me as one of them. So it was always, it was my kind of thing where I was almost had to fight my way into acceptance. Yeah. And then once they gave me a chance to see who I was, we became friends. And I still have friends that I've had since third or fourth grade. Yeah. You know what I mean? So being mixed it is not as easy as people would think it is because there's you really have no side to turn to. Yeah. Well, you actually have Nipsey Hussle tattooed on your hand. Yeah. Okay, can we go ahead and see that? Uh, I've interviewed Nipsey Hussle before. Uh, I have only positive things to right. say. Right, like, me too. My interview from, like I think it was like five years ago, what he was talking about, the way he carried himself, was exactly how people know him today. Mm-hmm. He was consistent the whole mm-hmm. time in terms of his values, his intelligence, the way, the way he carried himself, everything else like yeah. that. And you guys knew each other. Yeah, we, uh, you know, my brother is someone that's always had an ear for music, and my brother put me on a nip like in 2009 um, with his mixtapes. And then, Early? Yeah, very early. Very, that's when he was first coming first out. First coming out. Yeah. So I came to the Lakers in 2010, and I'm just, and I was already fucking with him. I'm just like, well, shit, I play for the Lakers now. Like, I could probably meet dude. So just kind of on some fan shit, I, I hit him on Twitter, and he hit me back. And I'm just like, oh, you know, I fuck with your music, man. I love your movement. Come to a game. Came to a game, kicked it, chopped it up, smoked. And then, um, you know, some out of love, he came and did one of my birthday parties in the Bay, which ended up being a disaster because I wanted to have a party 
at one of the big clubs in San Francisco, but I ended up doing a party at <laughs> Gloria's parents' nightclub, and they didn't promote him, promote him at all, so it was just an awkward-ass situation. Like, no one showed up, but he was cool, man. Him and his friends were in one area. I was, we, we were right next, and we were talking and communicating. He just came and did out of love and still did a few songs with nobody there, so he was just real cool, you know? So we just always connected. So it wasn't like we were the best of friends, but I just, like you said, you, you get a vibe and an energy from him that you know he's a solid dude. And then, you know, when he was still coming up, I remember him riding around in that little white drop top Mercedes he used to have and he would come to the South Bay and he went to this one little bar on um, PCH one time and I met him up there and we're upstairs so I'm playing for the Lakers at the time you know Nip is just you know people are starting to know his name and he's starting to you know to make a buzz but we're upstairs like burning this whole nightclub down upstairs smoking and people are like oh damn you play for the Lakers you're up here smoking and you're <laughs> fucking with Nip at the concert so I would never want to make it seem like we are a best friend, buddy, buddy situation, but it was just always love every time we seen each other. And he was just always a solid dude. And I just saw his evolution. And like you said, his grind and what he rapped about and his principles and what he stood for. And you really saw him evolve. And like I said, I was a fan, so I saw him evolve right in front of my eyes. And I seen him probably two weeks before he got shot, three weeks before he got shot. I had just got off the freeway in the valley about to go to my house and I pulled up to this gas station. And like I said, when I first met him, he had this little, uh, this little uh, white Mercedes with the top. He would always pull down, and I pull up behind him this time, and he 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 hops out, and he's getting gas. I'm getting gas, and he's in the Maybach, and I'm just like, it was dope to kind of see yeah. like, I saw where bro started in in 2010, and then in 2019, you know what I mean? It's just like, so I just we hadn't I hadn't seen each other we hadn't seen each other for a while, and I just told man, congrats, proud of you, man. How's the family? Just a quick gas station, chop it up, not knowing that that would be the last time. The last time, yeah. I mean, we both live in L.A. Just remember how sad it was in L.A. Oh, it was crazy. Like that whole week. It, 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 was, it, was, a, it yeah. was different because, like I said, I think that if you knew Nip, you knew everything was about and really fucked with him, but I really didn't feel like he had got out there yet. No. But no, I was... No, no, he was still a fairly underground artist. Right. But but the love, I've never seen anyone get love like he got, oh, ever. He, it was a Michael Jackson level it when was, he died. There's no Staples, question sold around the, the world. And, yeah. and I think it was unfortunate that people didn't get a chance to know him while he was up here moving and what he was doing and what he was about and his evolution and, 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 and his intelligence and his vision and his business mindset. But, you know, through his death, they always say, you know, artists, you know, get bigger, similar to Pac, you know, to me. You know, he rapped about it and said, like, I think he was our generation Pac. He was a little bit, he was obviously older than Pac, and I really think that, you know, his evolution and his mindset was where Pac was headed if he had some more years to, you know, underneath his belt, so. Because I remember, uh, I forgot who, who I was, uh, I think it was Malik Yoba when I interviewed him, where he talked about how Pac talked about changing the community, but Nip actually did it. Did it. Yeah, I mean... Tupac talked a lot about what we need to do for the community. And obviously, with his mother, Fanny, who was a, a panther, and, you know, by extension, the breakfast programs, education programs, all that kind of stuff that he was steeped in, he spoke to those things. But Nipsey was actually doing those things. The interesting thing about him is that he wasn't on everybody's radar like that. Right? And I think that it's the... The, the, the tragedy cracked open the truth of what dude was really doing. And that's what fucks people up. Because you realize, man, this dude was really doing it. He Did actually it. set up. And, you know, granted, Pac was probably going to do that's it. What I'm he saying. didn't have a chance to yet. 26 or and 25. He also wasn't Pac grounded died. in one community like right. Nipsey was. But Nipsey actually was buying up South Central. He was doing like it. he was actually buying a property. He was he had, a you know, that one a business center, mm -hmm. I think, uh, I forgot if it was a I or... I'm supposed to do an event, uh, yeah. Spectre 9 or Sector 9 or something. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Something like that. I'm supposed to do an event there. Yeah, me and him were supposed to do another interview. We, yeah. we, we, talk, we were tweeting each other publicly about doing another one, right. and it just never to, it just You never know, to happened. see that, it, it's tough. You know what I mean? And, and, and I just ran across something the other day, you know, where he's like, you know, I give back, but let's keep in mind, you know, the streets kept Jam Master J and the streets killed Pac, you know, so I do give back, but I still kind of keep mine. So I was reading up something that he said the other day, and it's just... It's sad, man, because he was one of those people that was, you know, a born leader. And, and, and definitely, although, you know, it was just real. He wasn't, he kept it real. It wasn't always sweet. 
and it's never going to be sweet. But he got it to a point where, you know, he was employing other people and giving back to his community and, and a father and, you know, uh, an amazing businessman. And, and to be, you know, cut short over some bullshit is crazy. Over some bullshit. Basically over some bullshit. Right up. Well, Matt Barnes, man, I appreciate you coming in and telling your story. Yeah, uh, I thank think it's, you, you know, it, it's one thing uh, to be a star in the NBA, to be a first round draft pick. And, you know, every time you feel like changing teams like LeBron, you mm -hmm. have every team on mm -hmm. the planet willing to, mm -hmm. to give you <laughs> everything they got. Yeah. But you actually struggled the yeah. whole time. You started out as a very low draft pick you didn't you you went into the d league in the beginning you were thinking about going back to football yeah. played for 10 different teams mm -hmm. would get mm -hmm. drafted to a team you wouldn't even play on mm -hmm. <laughs> instant trades yeah. waves everything else like that i just that. think i i got it out the mud and that's why i think i i i appreciated every step of the way but played the way i played you know i played yeah. every game like it was my last because it really could have been my last you know, so I just, uh, if, mm, if, I, good point. if yeah. I could have, you know, if I could have changed it and had a different career, I don't think, you know, I'd probably be broke and on some bullshit because everything came too easy. You know, I've, my whole life is always, I had to really go get it. And I think, you know, this NFL or this NBA thing was no different, you know, so it was, you know, it, it was something I had to do, something I'm proud of doing. And I kind of take a, you know, a step back now that I'm done because I was always on the chopping block when I was playing. You know, obviously for the end of my career, I was getting two or three year deals with some good money. But before that, it was it was year by year situation. So I can kind of take a look back. Like I played with some of the greatest players to ever touch the hardwood. And, you oh, know, yeah. I'm, I'm friends. With Kobe, Kobe, with Shaq, Allen Iverson, Iverson, uh, KD, Steph, yeah. uh, Baron Davis before he got injured, Chris Paul, Blake Griffin, Stephon Marbury, um, Chris Webber before he got hurt. You know, I got I played with Steve Nash, Grant Hill. Like I played with Hall, a bunch of Hall of Famers, man. Yeah. It's just like, yo, you weren't even supposed to make this shit. So now is the time where I really appreciate it. And and you know, I always had a, you know, a misconception of who I was. You know, there was always a he's this person, he's that person. And uh, you know, I, post career I've been really in, enjoying kind of opening eyeballs and changing people's perception of me because you saw the competitive side of me for two hours a night and post career you get to see you know who I am and, and what the, the family man and an entrepreneur and just what kind of person I am in general no doubt well Matt I appreciate you coming uh, in man, I appreciate you you know best of luck I can't wait to thank see what you. you got coming up thank you bro